Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham Stark and joining me is Matt Wiggins. Hello. And today we are here to talk about 1983's Octopussy. We sure are. And I'm going to come right out of the gate and say to you, the listener, what I texted to Matt as soon as I watched it, because we we like to not discuss the movies with one another until we're here recording, you know, so as not to spoil the magic of the moment, I suppose. (laughs) But I basically gave my feelings away pretty succinctly with my review of Octopussy is it is definitely the better of the two James Bond movies made in 1983. A sentiment with which I fundamentally agree with a question mark? I mean, it's about the nicest thing I can say about it. If it is better, it's by the skin of its teeth. I think it is categorically better in that it is clearly made by people who have made movies before. <laughs> All right, fair enough. And like, there's a lot of decisions in here that are not the right decisions, but the whole thing is constructed in a way that I didn't feel lost or confused because of pacing or editing. There were absolutely moments where I was like, wait, well, why? Because of yeah. scripting. <laughs> <laughs> but this feels like a more competently constructed, not particularly amazing James Bond movie than Never Say Never Again. All right. Yeah, I'll give you that. Directed by John Glenn, who has directed the last several, and screenplay by Richard Maybaum and Michael G. Wilson and George MacDonald Frazier. Okay who is a novelist and screenwriter known primarily for novels of the character Flashman. Flashman? Flashman. I have never heard of Flashman. Uh, he's like a he's like a Victorian era James Bond, honestly. Okay. He's like a British Army Victorian era anti-hero soldier who is a very charismatic scoundrel had a series of popular novels written about him and one movie in which he was portrayed by Malcolm McDowell. Huh. Yeah, I kind of want to watch the movie because the Wikipedia (laughs) entry says that it received fairly positive critic reviews, but had a very limited theatrical release. Interesting. Yeah. What's it it called? Is it just called Flashman? No, it's called it's called Royal Flash. Okay. Which is the name of the second Flashman novel? I don't know. It it it's probably not great, but anyway, I, I don't know. I don't know why they included him in this, but uh, they brought him on board to do some scripting for the movie. They needed all the help they could get. Yeah, because it's based on. Well, it isn't. Sorry. The there's a short story in Ian Fleming's short story collection called Octopussy and the Living Daylights, mm. but there's like nothing to do with. Fleming's story. The notable thing is the movie features the return of Roger Moore as James Bond. And that is something even the production was kind of surprised by because he had signed on for three or four movies. I can't remember if Moonraker was the last one he was under full contract for or if moonraker was the first one he was on a i think it was moonraker was the first one that he was on movie by movie contract and then he came back for for your eyes only and then everyone sort of assumed that that was gonna be it for roger moore to the point that if you look on the dvd for this there's extensive screen tests with james brolin who is josh brolin's dad i was just about to ask yeah yeah doing full screen tests with maude adams huh and it's unusual too because he's american and he's playing it like an american right i can't count how many times so far on the podcast i have said they considered x person but didn't end up going with him because everyone thought it would be weird for james bond to be an american but they were pretty far through this they hadn't signed him yet and basically they got wind of never say never again happening with connery and they were afraid of going up against a bond film with sean connery introducing a brand new unknown american bond and they were like you know let's try to get roger back right none of that excuses why he came back again (laughs) 
<laughs> after this. But yeah, I mean, we gave we gave Connery a little bit of the gears for Diamonds Are Forever, sort of looking a little long in the tooth. And we mentioned it in passing for For Your Eyes Only. But For Your Eyes Only ended up being a pretty great movie. Boy, Roger Moore is getting on a bit in this movie. He sure is. Although, like, to his credit, uh, he still mostly carries it. Of the many <laughs> of the many problems I had with this film, Roger Moore was not really one of them. It's true. Honestly, he, he's so charismatic and affable. <laughs> I mentioned that James Brolin was doing screen tests with Maude Adams, mm -hmm. who we talked about in The Man with the Golden Gun. We mentioned right. already that she would be returning for the role of the, the character known as Octopussy, though never actually given a real name. Just, that's her character, I guess. And yes, that is the, the name of this movie. <laughs> the, 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 the making of featurette on the, the Blu-rays has this section where everyone talks about calling the movie Octopussy, but no one defends or explains it. <laughs> it's just a montage of people going... Everyone was like, you're not really calling the movie that, are you? That can't possibly be the name of the movie. Is that really what you're going to call the movie? Anyway, the visual effects were it, it just like... <laughs> no one tries to explain it. It's just like, yep, everybody thought it was weird. Next question. Like... <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, everybody clearly thought it was weird enough that they put a... Even Bond reacts to the name in movie, in character. Yeah. Like, they, they clearly knew it was a, a bold choice. It certainly was. Yeah. Shall we begin? I guess so. Why not? Why not? We got nothing else to do. So the movie opens with a shot of some vehicles arriving at a military base. Standard military vehicles, there's an APC, there's a transport truck, and then there's this brown pickup truck towing a horse trailer behind it, driven by James Bond. But it diverts at the last second before pulling into this military base and pulls up at a racetrack that's apparently across the street. Bond drives the truck into uh, into the sort of parking area and parks with the other vehicles. We cut to a shot of some Central American looking military leaders applauding the race as it takes place. And among these leaders is a, uh, a woman in a white dress. We come back to Bond who gets out of the truck and proceeds to pull a rapid change of his outfit. He's dressed like, you know, sort of a horse owner. He pulls his jacket off, turns it inside out. It's a military jacket on the inside. He takes his flat cap and turns it inside out, and it's a military cap. And while he's doing this, the woman who was with the other leaders walks over. She gives him an ID that names him as Colonel Louis Toro and pins on a fake mustache to make him look like the fellow in the picture. And Bond takes this opportunity to infiltrate the airbase. We will learn as he comes in that they are working on the test flight of a new plane radar system. Bond has been dispatched to destroy the, the plane before they can test it. Posing as this colonel, he walks into the hangar and goes to inspect the plane. He walks up behind a guy who's like working on the mechanics of the plane and judo chops him across the back of the head, rendering him unconscious. As this is happening, we get a cutaway shot of the actual Colonel Toro, who also has just walked into the hangar at this time. So Bond opens his attache case, pulls out a little time bomb that he has stashed inside it, places the time bomb inside the plane just in time to be ambushed by a whole squad of soldiers with guns trained on him and the real Toro walks over having caught Bond and Bond is escorted away as they find and recover the explosive device from inside the plane. The woman that met Bond is sitting there waiting in the brown truck, and she sees this military transport drive by with Bond, now obviously captured, sitting in the back, drives alongside and pulls up next to this transport truck with Bond in it and uh, starts flashing the goods. 
puts on a sultry look, makes a little smoochy face, and begins to sort of try to draw the attention of the soldiers, showing as much leg as she can. Bond, on to what's happening here, continues to sort of egg the soldiers on. It's like, hey, check it out. Look, see what's going on over there. And when they're both distracted, he reaches over and pulls the rip cords on the parachutes that the two soldiers are wearing, causing the parachutes to catch the wind behind the truck and pull the soldiers off of the truck. He grabs one of their guns and hops across into his brown truck and then uses the gun that he's grabbed to shoot out the the tires of the the transport truck that had been carrying him previously and it goes off into a chicken coop and crashes. He then wishes farewell to his contact, hops onto the trailer, releases it from the back of the truck and climbs in through a door. And moments later, as the soldiers are in hot pursuit, the back end of the trailer folds down and the dummy horse butt folds up a tiny jet plane rolls out of the back of the trailer and bond proceeds to uh, to gun it takes off just over the heads of the pursuit cars that are chasing him and then we have this fairly lengthy scene of bond trick flying in this cute little plane as they try to shoot him down with assault rifles and then fire surface to air missiles and he evades the missiles culminating finally in bond Still followed by the heat-seeking missile, he dives low, flies into the hangar where the test plane is located, pulling the missile along behind him, manages to tip himself up on end and fly through the rapidly closing door on the far side of the hangar, and the surface-to-air missile hits the ground inside the hangar, blowing up the test plane and all the other planes along with it, as Bond makes his escape in his little tiny jet, only to discover that his tiny jet is running low on fuel so he sets it down on a highway and rolls to a stop just as he arrives at a local gas station and the opening sequence ends as the little old man who's watching this gas station stands up looking kind of shocked that there's a plane and bond leans over and says fill her up please ultimately this is a pretty fun little pre-title sequence it's very silly but it's ultimately like yeah right that's yeah it's the beginning of a james bond movie Go for it. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, the plane is a real plane, and it's an actual jet-powered airplane. It's called the Bede BD-5. Thank you, Internet Plane Database. And it's, uh, (laughs) yeah, it was a real thing. And so it's an actual, like, single-seater jet plane that could fit in a horse trailer. And the acrobatic flying is fun. The horse butt is hilarious. That's a nice trick. The quick change with the reversible costume, that's a cute trick. I like the quick change. Like, I don't know. This is a fun one. It's pretty light, but it's a fun one. We then move to the opening titles, where Maurice Binder has discovered that it is 1983 and lasers exist. (laughs) I I mean, honestly, it's like, it's kind of cool. It's in that it's a variation on his sort of standard modus operandi, rather than purely just silhouettes of nude women. Now there's some actual nude women filmed in very deep shadow so that you can't see any. Well, you can kind of see some... (laughs) You can kind of see some nipples, actually, in this being illuminated by laser light images of Roger Moore in silhouette, the 007 logo and an octopus. Mm -hmm. It's otherwise okay. Yeah, it's a bit of a callback because they did the whole like light projecting the credits in a previous movie many movies ago. Yeah, we once again have lots of like women doing flips and so on in silhouette. Like, yeah, it's fine. It's funny because there's like some sort of acrobatic stuff, which is maybe kind of makes sense because there's circus elements in the movie but there's also like figure skating things and that's completely like that that was in the last movie i don't know if this is like leftover silhouette stock from for your eyes only yeah the song is all time high performed by rita coolidge music by john barry lyrics by tim rice tim rice has done a lot of work with andrew lloyd weber and it's okay viewer at home here's a little look behind the curtain we're recording this on a tuesday matt tends to watch these on sunday night so they're a little more present in his mind i just because of how my week works out i tend to watch them on friday or saturday and i want to say that i watched this one on saturday and i don't remember anything about the song that's fine i recall at the time that i was like yeah but now i actually truly cannot remember 
how it sounds or any of the lyrics apart from all time high you're an all time high okay yeah da, yeah, da, yeah all right da, 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 da. cowards da, for not da, 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 doing a song with the words octopusy in it yeah <laughs> absolutely cowards yeah it's not my favorite it's possibly one of my least favorite for the reasons mentioned it's got a you know it's got a nice smooth saxophone going in it that's cool when's the last time we had a real banger or belter was it man with a golden gun pretty much because man with the golden gun went into spy who loved me which was nobody does it better and then spy who loved me went into moonraker which was close but ended up very much being a ballad yeah and then it was for your eyes only only for you which is like okay but again very sort of i mean the 80s were a dark time for film music <laughs> I think the 80s might have been a dark time for certain genres of film. Like, there's some great, you know, and ridiculous action movies that came out of the 80s and maybe the the beginnings of the teen comedy and stuff like that. But I don't think the 80s were, at least not the beginning of the 80s, were a great time for <laughs> Bond films. Yeah, like, I, I'm trying to think of, of music. And I guess we're actually talking like the back half of the 70s and the first half of the 80s. Yeah, yeah. And it's all like smooth, sultry, down tempo, adult contemporary, as you, we described it last time. Mm -hmm. And it won't be until the next film, View to a Kill, where we start getting a little more upbeat and back into the the banger territory. Because as I recall, the theme song for View to a Kill rates banger status. Spoilers, it rules. I, I'm not going to say it's necessarily the best banger. No, but, but it, it rules. It fits into that classification. <laughs> like, I don't think we have another proper ballad until License to Kill, which is maybe actually a belter. It's been long enough since I've heard it that I don't remember for sure. But this is very mellow, very forgettable. <laughs> Yeah. It's not great. So let's move along then, I suppose, to East Berlin. It's 1983. The Berlin Wall is very much still standing, and we get a shot of East Berlin, and then we cut to a big top circus and a clown desperately trying to escape from it. Yeah. As soon as I saw the clown, I was like, oh, I, I remember this movie now. <laughs> It's a very distinctive visual. Well, he's such a very distinctive clown. Yeah. So hot on his tails, we have a couple of knife throwers. It, it actually, initially, it looks like it's only a single knife thrower, dude with like a big Bowie knife running along in his, in his uniform. But we find out pretty quickly that it's actually a pair of twin knife throwers that are hot on his heels. Anyway, he's making a break for it. He's running through the forest, trying to get away as fast as he can, as fast as his giant clown shoes will carry him. <laughs> <laughs> leaving bits and pieces of his costume behind making himself very easy to track he loses a piece of his costume on a barbed wire fence he loses his hat for whatever reason he's carting like helium balloons behind him and one of them catches on a plant and pops which gives away his location he obviously left in a big hurry yeah he clearly took off running he gets startled by one of the the knife throwers turning up right in front of him like he thinks he's being chased by one guy and he sees him behind him and turns around and the other one is right there they get into an altercation and and he takes a knife across the arm in the fight but he manages to sort of like kick the guy and get away and he gets to like a border control bridge starts trying to like cross the river to get back into west berlin and as he does this one of the knife throwers throws a knife and it hits the bridge beside him you know he keeps climbing and then the other knife thrower wings a, a knife at him and catches him right in the back he falls off the bridge into the river and is swept downstream we see a few moments later that he's actually survived this. He washes up on shore downstream and sort of pulls himself out of the river. And then we cut to the home of the British ambassador, where clearly a party is taking place. Guests are arriving and people are being escorted from their cars. And this clown, now kind of bedraggled and soaking wet and with a glove saturated in blood, drags himself onto the property and crashes through the window into the main bedroom, where he falls dead in front of the British ambassador and his wife and drops a Fabergé egg which rolls across the floor. Cut to 
London, England. We will find out very shortly that this poor clown is Agent 009, who goes unnamed, but is 009, played by Andy Bradford, who is primarily a stunt performer. He's been in lots of things as actors, but I assume that like this, it's acting roles that are mostly stunt focused, is my assumption. Still working today as a stunt coordinator. Oh, wow. Yeah, most recently on Fleabag. Oh, cool. Despite the fact that, I mean, maybe even amplified by the fact that one of them is a clown, this is a kind of a cool sequence. It's unfortunate because like the pre-title is like, yep, this sure is James Bond. And then the sequence is like, all right, this is actually like kind of scary. And why is he a clown? And then he's dead and he has a Fabergé egg. What What's going on? Remember, like we watched For Your Eyes Only, which we really liked. And then this one starts up and I'm like, all right, all right, I'm digging this so far. And then it just sort of just sort of spirals down words over the course of it <laughs> i think part of the problem with this movie is present in this scene though you're right it is an intense and and like exciting scene or it you know would be if he weren't a giant floppy clown running for his life i kind of like that and then it's a faberge egg it's like what is going on we have fancy jewel thieving and a ridiculous circus clown and circus performer assassins and it's exciting but it's also very tonally weird and <laughs> i i have a bit of a hard time taking the scene seriously just because of how silly the clown is and i know what's coming as a result of the clown like this is not something that would necessarily affect somebody coming to this movie for the first time in the same way the whole scene feels very surreal that's fair still i'm with you so far i'm still on board <laughs> mm-hmm. So we cut to London, MI6. We open on Money Penny's office. We have a first person view of Bond with his hat, getting ready to throw his hat at the hat rack, which is not there anymore. Yeah, there's a woman there trying to straighten a picture. She turns around and he says, Oh, Money Penny, you look lovelier every day. And then hangs his hat on the hat rack, which is right next to the door, only for Money Penny to turn around on the other side of the room and introduce her new assistant. Oh, what's the assistant's name? Penelope Smallbone. That's right. Miss Smallbone. And we have the typical sort of Money Penny banter back and forth as Money Penny basically tells Miss Smallbone not to fall for his affections and his advances. Bond continues to sort of put on the charm for both of them, offering Money Penny a carnation from the bouquet of flowers he has and the remaining bouquet of flowers to Miss Smallbone, who then proceeds to immediately identify him as, ah, you must be James Bond. And he's like, oh, you know me. And she's like, well, Money Penny described you to me the description was unmistakable and and money penny makes a quip about having done so in exhausting nauseating detail Mm -hmm. and then they they usher bond into m's office there is no payoff for this nope it's implied that perhaps they were considering retiring lois maxwell and this was apparently you know she she arrived or saw the script or whatever and he was like we've given money penny a young hot assistant and she's like oh okay i get it i see what you're doing (laughs) yeah but that doesn't happen because she's back in the next movie and miss smallbone is not so don't count on ever seeing miss smallbone again even in this film i can't even find other movie credits oh that's not true she was in nope yep nope no other movie credits okay great good wow wow all right. One one TV credit. I mean, it's better than Bianca, his contact in the pre-title, played by Tina Hudson, whose only IMDb entry is this. Really? Yeah. Oh, I would not have called that. No, me neither. Huh. But Bond goes into the other room and meets M. M is back, played by Robert Brown. We, we mentioned that he played Admiral Hargreaves in... One of the previous movies. One of the previous movies that involved the Navy. Yes, it was The Spy <laughs> Who Loved Me, yes. All right, good. So now he is M. And again, we don't know if it's meant to be the same character or not. And why not? Let's say he is. Sure. There's a new M. He certainly plays it differently than Bernard Lee, but generally speaking, performs a similar role of assisting with the exposition and being kind of tired of Bond's shenanigans, but ultimately getting out of Bond's way and letting him do his job. Yeah, he he comes off as a little less tired of Bond's shenanigans. Yes. The way this scene plays out is almost like he's just he just gives Bond an opportunity to show off and gets out of his way. Yeah. And then smiles when he when he succeeds. 
proceeds, right? Like he's like, what do you know about Fabergé eggs? And and Bond proceeds to open up the encyclopedia of his mind and describe everything he knows about Fabergé eggs. And M's just like, hmm, quite right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also in the room are Frederick Gray, the Minister of Defense, played still by Jeffrey Keane, and Douglas Wilmer as Fanning's, an antiquities expert. And yeah, M is like, so what do you know about Fabergé eggs? While well, he hands him this Fabergé egg. And, and what does Bond know about Fabergé eggs? Well, he knows that they are Easter eggs made by, I'm not going to be able to get the name of the, the artist who made them because I don't know that much about Fabergé eggs, but they were made by Fabergé as a Easter present for the Russian royal family. They are very rare. They are very expensive. They are opulently jeweled. You know, he, he looks at this one and it's like, this is a fine example, he is then informed that it would be were it not a fake because the real one is on auction at Sotheby's auctioneers and will be sold soon. Yeah. The House of Fabergé, founded by Gustave Fabergé, founded in 1842, nationalized in 1918. We don't need to get into that. But yeah, they probably what they're most famously known for is the 52 imperial eggs, only 46 of which have survived, which were, yeah, they were made as Easter eggs. And so they're, you can actually find on Wikipedia, for example, a complete breakdown of all known Fabergé eggs and their current whereabouts and general value. It looks like a surprising number of them are currently under the ownership of the same person who is a Russian oligarch. Of course it is. Right. That makes sense. All yeah. right. Anyway. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I remember learning about Fabergé eggs when I was quite young. I think my dad had like a coffee table book of them. They're really intricate and amazing. This one is... Ah, uh, yes. Is this a replication of a real Fabergé egg? As near as I can tell, no, but it is most similar to the coronation egg in that it has... It's different coloring, but it has a similar design to the 1897 imperial coronation egg which is much more of a gold design rather than green but it opens in the same way and instead of this one which has sort of a like an imperial carriage seated within it the real one has an entire carriage that comes out of it based on a real egg but not itself a real egg yeah well it's a good egg it's a good egg anyhow the real one of course is is on sale at Sotheby's it's and Sotheby's Sotheby's. <laughs> sure. Look, I'm just it's on auction. <laughs> this is how they say it. I know it's I know, I know we'll, it's spelled we'll get letters. I know it's spelled Sotheby's. I'm just anglicizing it, which is a real ironic thing to say <laughs> considering it's an English word. <laughs> <laughs> I took that moment to have a sip of water and that was a big mistake. <laughs> Dangerous times we live in, Graham, yeah. when we're recording. You've really got to work on the timing for when you have a sip. <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> so anyhow, the result of all this is that Bond is going to join the jeweler at the auction because they don't know who owns the real egg. And they anticipate that the owner of the real egg will turn up. It's being auctioned anonymously. They they have a sense the real owner will be there just out of curiosity because that often happens. Bond is going to go with the jeweler to try and figure out who actually owns it to see if they can get a lead. And Bond points out the lot in the auction manual is titled Property of a Lady. He suggests that they have at least one clue as to who the real owner of this Fabergé egg is. Which is like hardly that could it could be meaningless. I think it actually turns out to basically be meaningless. <laughs> yeah. Before we see the auction, we have a cutaway in. I mean, but my favorite set of this movie for sure. Like this yeah. this amazing Russian high command set of a meeting of all of the generals and high ranking government officials of the Russian government sitting around this massive semicircular marble table in this absolute vault of a marble room with an enormous world map <laughs> on the far wall, a huge portrait of Lenin taking over one of the walls. It's just, it's a fantastic set. And seated at the table is our old friend General Gogol and many other people. And also General Orlov, who will speak up shortly because General Gogol is saying he thinks that NATO's idea for trying to, you know, maybe pump the brakes a little on having quite so many nukes is probably a good idea. And he thinks mm -hmm. that they should listen to the advice of the NATO advisors, the advice of the advisors, and have fewer nuclear weapons. 
General Orlov objects loudly and vehemently and goes off on a he goes off on a tear. So he stands up. He has a presentation prepared for this. Yeah. Have you ever objected to something so strongly that you went back in time and created a PowerPoint presentation so that you could demonstrate <laughs> how strongly you object on the wall of a conference room? Yeah, man. Like, this is wild. He hits a button. The table rotates 90 degrees counterclockwise, and he walks over to a different, smaller map that opens on the wall. And he's like, look, if they're all going to disarm, we have all these tanks across the East German, all these tank divisions across the East German border. We have all these tank divisions in Czechoslovakia. They don't have nearly so many tanks. We have so many tanks. He spends a lot of time talking about how many tanks they have. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you just give me the go ahead. We can take these tanks, push right through, take over West Germany. We'll take over Central Europe, you know, the Netherlands. Why not? And then we get to be the ultimate power. That's what I want. And let's make it happen, guys. And Gogol is like, you know how many of our citizens this is going to kill? And then also <laughs> the rest of NATO will retaliate with nuclear weapons. And Orlov is like, ah, they won't. Yeah. He's like, nah, they don't have the stomach for it. I can conquer Central Europe in five days and they won't do anything, which seems like a totally stable and balanced plan. Yeah. Stephen Burkoff, who is playing General Orlov, seems completely aware of the kind of movie this is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, he's given such a great performance in this scene. I like one of the things I like in this scene uh, quite a lot, actually, is like all of the civil servants in this scene are like seated mostly upright and paying attention engaged with the meeting and then you see general gogol who's like slumped in his chair kind of slouchy and just like we should just not have a nuclear war <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it's a particularly controversial opinion yeah and, and then there's orlov who's like this much smaller kind of sniveling man also sunk way down into his chair his body language is like nah that's stupid <laughs> We should totally have a nuclear war. We should just roll our tanks across Europe. It's our destiny to own all of Europe. And y'all are cowardly idiots who I'm wasting my time being here with and giving this extremely detailed power presentation to. Just give me the go ahead and I'll make it yours. He's given it in this scene and I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stephen Burkhoff also played Lieutenant Colonel Podovsky in Rambo First Blood Part 2. Ah, oh, yes. Rambo 2, I guess. And Victor Matland in Beverly Hills Cop. So he plays... <laughs> he's got a couple memorable roles as bad guys. Yeah. General Golgol, who again is even more clear in this movie, is the good kind of Russian, you see. He's the friendly mm -hmm. Russian who doesn't want to bomb all of us. He's like, S -s stop it. Sit down. Don't be stupid. The, the room has a secretary. There's a secretary in this massive vaulted ceilinged room. She gets a message and comes over and gives it to General Orlov, who says, let them know I'll contact them soon. And then we cut to the Kremlin Art Repository. Yeah, which has a great transition. I love it. The switch to the Kremlin Art Repository, where it's like the sign on the wall basically says Kremlin Art Repository, but they put the screen text to tell you where you are aligned over top of the text on the, the sign on the, the wall outside the building. And then as the camera turns, it turns with the camera like... That's a cute little transition, and I like it. I like that they have costumed extras doing military drills in the scene that are only visible in the reflection of the sign. <laughs> it's a heck of an attention to detail. Yeah. Orlov goes inside, and inside he finds the curator of the Kremlin Art Repository and one of the knife-throwing assassins that we saw chase down the clown earlier. I, I'm not sure which one this is. Their names are Mishka and Grishka, and they're played by David Meyer and Anthony Meyer. Ah, yeah, it's one of them. It sort of is immaterial throughout the film which one you're dealing with at any given point in time. Yeah, which is a point of needless confusion for a viewer, <laughs> I would say. They're fu functionally interchangeable. There's just two of them. Yeah. Mishka and or Grishka, uh, specifically or, not and, <laughs> reports a man stole the forged Fabergé egg and that they were able to kill him, but he got away with the forgery. And this causes the curator of the art repository some manner of grief because he's like, well, the auction is in like a day or two. We don't have time to make a new one. What are we going to do? <laughs> Knowing that the fake egg is missing, 
and that this could throw their whole plan into disarray, though it's unclear what their plan actually is. And it will kind of remain unclear what their plan actually is? Yes, it sure will. (laughs) Orlov says that he'll tell the contact in London that they have to buy the egg at auction. It'll be a setback, but they have to get it back so that they know that they can sort of keep control of the situation. Then we cut. To the Sotheby's auction house, as you going to criticize my pronunciation of Sotheby's again? No, I'm not criticizing. I'm just laughing. <laughs> so anyhow, we cut to the uh, the auction in progress as the egg is introduced. Bond and the jeweler are seated up front, observing the auction. The jeweler is, is sort of watching the auction, and Bond is is sort of casually observing it mostly interested in the crowd as the egg is paraded around he notices a very striking woman walk in the door and he comments to the jeweler friend now there's a lady and she sits down next to a man they exchange some words we don't know what those words are yet bidding begins the egg starts to bid up and the jeweler says Mm, this shouldn't go for more than about three hundred and fifty thousand at the like the outside it's valuable but it, it that's about what it should be Bidding starts to count up, people start looking at the egg, and then the man that this woman has sat down next to starts to bid, and he starts taking the the lead and continues to push the price up. Eventually, the price gets beyond where the jeweler said it was reasonable. The man has the leading bid, and the jeweler remarks, okay, well, he's he's gone over the top now. Nobody else will bid. He's going to buy it. And then suddenly, the auctioneer exclaims that they have a new high bid. The jeweler looks over at Bond, who has his hand raised. Bond is like, eh, let's see how high he'll go. <laughs> a bidding war begins. <laughs> Eventually, Bond calls the egg over to have a closer look at it he picks it up off the pillow and he's holding a book he inspects it and sort of looks at his book and then he passes it under the book into his lap and then behind the book and then hands it back out in a move that i am absolutely certain no fine art security person would ever let you get away with (laughs) but (laughs) but he does it and he gets away with it and puts the egg back and then declines to bid any further the man wins the egg for a price of... It's like 500,000 pounds or something. 500,000 pounds, yeah. It's it's like an enormous value, way overvalued relative to what it is. And the, the auction ends and the man the man takes his prize. The jeweler, kind of shocked, r- remarks, you know, well, we could have gotten stuck with it, but everything has worked out. They, they got a feel for how desperate this man was for it. And the auction has ended, no harm, no foul. And Bond also says, we were never going to get stuck with it because he had to buy it. Yeah. Bond is now determined to find out why. So he tails her outside. He tails the woman outside and watches her get into a town car being driven by a man in a red turban. The The man he was bidding against walks out, scowling a hole in the back of Bond's head as he walks by. And he also gets into this town car and they drive away. Bond signals to a cab as if he wants to be picked up, but the cab pulls away, sort of nods at Bond and then tails the town car. So then we cut back to M's office. M is tearing a strip off Bond for bidding because, you know, what we couldn't afford that. What do you like? Where where was that? Not not we couldn't afford that. But like, where do you think that money was going to come from if you had won it? And now we have nothing to go off on. And Bond is like, well, I mean, I have the real egg because I <laughs> I swapped them. I swapped the fake egg with the real egg. So that person's going to be pretty upset. M says, well, surely they'll complain. And Bond is like, well, that depends on what they're up to. I don't think he will. I I think he's involved in this in some way. I I think he is now stuck with the fake egg and will remain stuck with the fake egg and stew in silence. So Emma's basically, all right, so follow up on your lead. Let's find out all we can about these people. You go after them. See what you can get. Oh, and sign a chit for that egg on your way out the door, would you? Because it's government property now. I do like that the taxi that tailed them found that they got on a flight to India. So he says, all right, you get on the next flight to India. And Bond pulls a ticket out of his coat and goes, great, I've got 50 minutes to get to the airport. <laughs> way ahead of you there so then we cut to india yeah there's some very cool establishing shots great shot of the taj mahal most of the 
location shooting in India was done in Udaipur, during which time they were basically the the cast and crew and everyone were basically the guests of the royal Maharana Bhagwat Singh, which is apparently a Maharana is higher even than a Maharaja and oh. would entertain the cast and crew at his palace for dinner. They talk about being served rose wine that he would make on site. Sounds phenomenal. So yeah, James Bond film shot in India. So there's, you know, there's a fair crack of stereotypes to sort of wade through. And certainly not all of them are, not everything that Bond encounters while walking down the streets in India is something that the normal person would encounter walking down the streets in India. Yeah. I admit I have not gone deep on which of these things are historically accurate. But the first thing that he encounters is a snake charmer, man with a flute and a cobra and a basket. And he, the man's playing the flute and the cobra's dancing around. And then the man plays the James Bond theme on his flute. He sure does. Now, we talked last time about the word diegetic. Uh-huh. So this is the only time that the James Bond theme has appeared in a diegetic way, which is to say, in the world of James Bond, which is by itself maybe a little odd. But the stranger thing is that Bond immediately goes, huh, my tune. He recognizes the song. Yeah, the way it plays, it looks like he's recognized as like, ah, they're playing my theme song. I hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate it so much. I, I'm not a fan myself. It jumps the shark so completely. I just, I despise this. <laughs> It's so tacky. Yep. You can do this kind of thing in a cute way. This is not it. It's so on the nose. I hate it. <laughs> Bond turns around and introduces himself to the snake charmer, a character by the name, I want to say it's VJ. Correct. Yeah, the character's name is VJ, and the actor's name is VJ. VJ Amritraj. Ah who is a former tennis player, was still actively a tennis player at the time. This was his first movie role of, like, four. Right. He was in Star Trek Four. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he played a starship captain in Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home. Good on him. Yeah. Uh, Cubby Broccoli was, like, met him at Wimbledon and asked him to come and screen test for this character. Like, I, I don't know why. Like, I, it's a bizarre thing to be like, yeah, this tennis player that I quite like come and audition for a Bond film. But VJ might be the best part of the movie. Yeah, I mean, he's not bad at all. Yeah. That you've now explained the tennis jokes. Yes. That are yet to come. They do lampshade that rather spectacularly. He, like, uses a tennis racket as a weapon. But also, like, there's a whole exchange. He's like, oh, yes, I'm employed at this club as the tennis pro. Bond is like, oh, well, did you learn anything? It's like, well, my backhand has improved remarkably. Yeah. Did we say this was Bond's MI6 contact? Yes. Okay. Well, we haven't said that yet, but we, you have now said that. Great. I did that. He is. He, this is, that's who that's, this, this is. He also, the actor, did not like snakes. Which is why there's that very awkward cut of him barely managing to put down the basket and being like, this was a terrible cover for someone who's afraid of snakes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> See, this is the thing with this movie. It does all these stupid things, some of which I love and some of which I hate, but I like that line. Yeah. <laughs> That line feels very in keeping with a Bond movie and your wacky comic relief character. Yeah. <sighs> so VJ introduces Bond to Sadruddin, who is the head of Station I, MI6's station in India. He's played by Albert Moses, who also played a barman in The Spy Who Loved Me. Okay. He's been in a variety of things, according to his Wikipedia entry. Best known for the role of Ranjit Singh in the television sitcom Mind Your Language, which is a UK sitcom from the... 70s i have not heard of mind your language nor have i so he says that he'll check in with bond later and they get into a tuk tuk drive away i do like the shots of them riding around in this thing yeah it's, it's a good like it's a good shot they're like driving right through town they pause to point out the moon palace which is a castle looking palace up on top of a hill which is where the man lives so we've it's they've learned a little bit about the guy who bought the egg yes which is that his name is kamal khan he's an exiled afghan prince and he lives up in that palace they're gonna try and introduce bond 
Bond to him because during the day he comes down to this casino to play backgammon. So Bond is like, oh, well, I should go say hi then. And VJ says he'll go change and catch up with them later. Bond checks into the hotel and casino. While he's unpacking, he looks out the window and there's this amazing boat arriving. And the woman that he saw at Sotheby's is getting off the boat. The woman's name is Magda, played by Christina Wayborn. And I don't understand who her character is loyal to, but more on that later. The boat itself is flying a flag with a blue ringed octopus on it. Maybe that will be relevant since we all know what the movie's called. <laughs> So Bond in his white tuxedo heads to the casino and he sees Kamal Khan playing backgammon, absolutely soaking some dude at the game, you know, doing the classic, like, do you want to raise the stakes kind of thing? And the guy's like, yeah, I got to win some of my money back and then, you know, loses again. Bond observes Khan as being cagey about his dice and assumes that he's using fixed dice, which I mean, spoilers. Yes, obviously he is. Bond tries to ingratiate himself to Magda, who is having none of it. He's like, well, hello, it's it's me from the from the auction. How's it going? Can I buy you a drink? She's like, nope, not thirsty anymore. Bye. And gets back up and goes and stands by Khan, who tries to encourage his opponent to raise the limit to $10,000. And the guy's like, nope, can't afford that. And Bond goes, oh, I, I would have taken that bet. And Khan goes, OK, then take the bet. Have a seat. Let's play. Bond loses the first throw and Bond is like, all right, well, double or nothing. Khan says, sure. And then Bond says, all right, but I exercise. I can't remember what he says, but he's like exercise. Player's privilege. Player's privilege to use Khan's dice. That is not a rule of backgammon. <laughs> that is not a real thing. But no one seems to stop him. So he uses Khan's dice and, of course, rolls perfect double sixes. This is after I should I should say, because he asks if he can raise the stakes and Khan's like, well, do you are you good for this money? Do we even know that you can pay this? And Bond pulls out the egg. Well, how about this? And Khan's like, OK, then I guess we're going to do this. So he uses Khan's dice, rolls double sixes, asks Khan to make the check out to cash. <laughs> <laughs> Khan basically threatens Bond. He's like, I can't remember exactly what he says. He says, be sure to spend the money quickly, Mr. Bond. That is good. I did like that. Yeah, this scene is pretty good. This is another one of those examples of Bond outing himself hmm. as an antagonist to the villain right out of the gate, sauntering up after having just doubled the price of a thing and then stranding the people bidding on the thing with a fake, just like walking into their casino, placing the real egg on the table as collateral for the bet you're about to make demonstrating to everybody watching that your opponent is cheating soaking him for 20,000 rupees or or whatever the value of the bet was and then telling him that you don't trust him with a check and you want it made out to cash <laughs> it's like the gutsiest set of moves he then proceeds to, like, grab the Fabergé egg after winning the bet and stuffing it back in his pocket. All right, cool. Nice playing with you. This is a power ranking that is not going to exist, but where do you where do you rank Bond being an asshole at a betting table of that, which is a good move, compared to the one in Casino Royale with Daniel Craig, where he knows mathematically that he has an unbeatable hand? <laughs> And says to the dealer, oh, it's OK. Let him make this outside bet. Give him a chance to win his money back when he knows <laughs> he's not going to lose the hand when he just like, well, just like hook line is just, just like reels the guy in. <laughs> yeah, that's that's maybe more of a, a jerk move, but it like good gambling oh it's so good right? it's so like, good it's he's just baiting the guy this is like walking into the room balls swinging <laughs> 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 this is this is like thunderball where he walks up to the table and is like hi i'm james bond i'm gonna kill you before this movie is over oh can i buy your girlfriend a drink right like yeah. <laughs> this is about as like forward presenting as bond can get in a movie mm -hmm. He tries to hand the dice back to Khan, but they are grabbed by Gobinda, Khan's bodyguard and henchman with the turban, who grabs the dice and grinds them into dust in his bare fist. <laughs> I quite like Gobinda, played by Kabir Bedi, who is certainly one of, if not the most famous Indian actors within India who does not make movies purely within India. I know that's a weird caveat, but like he's a very famous actor in India for doing international work. Right. Right. Like 
probably the most famous actor in India, I absolutely could not name because I am not from there and have not watched their movies. But in the realm of people who have worked in the US and Europe, which he has, he's very famous within India for it. And he's honestly great in this movie. I I wish he had a little more characterization. And literally anything to do. Yeah, up until the very end, he just does whatever Khan says. That's it. The only time anything different happens is at the very end of the movie. Khan is like, okay, now do this. And Gobind is like, really? And he's like, yes. <laughs> okay. Like that's the only time when there's anything other than just being the heavy, but he's a charismatic heavy. Yeah, he's good. So Bond gets his cash. It, this is another fun scene. Just, I don't know. There, there's lots of fun scenes in this movie, despite my not thinking very highly of it on the whole. The waiter guy who's got, who went and cashed out their chips comes over. Just got a tray piled with stacks of bills and and Bond grabs like three and stuffs them in the inner pocket, like his breast pocket of his jacket, hands two stacks to VJ and hands two stacks to the station chief and leaves an entire stack of bills on the tray as a tip yeah. for the, the waiter guy. And then they head outside and they get back onto a little tuk tuk and a chase begins as Gobinda has this ridiculous blunderbuss looking gun which he is uh slotted to shotgun shells into and he sees Bond and crew get into their little vehicle and as they pull out so does he and a chase begins through through the streets and I think VJ here has what might be the line of the movie for me anyway because Bond is looking out the back and sees Gobinda with this blunderbuss chasing them and goes VJ we've got company and and VJ goes, don't worry, it's a company car. The company being Universal Exports, a.k.a. MI6. Right. So he gasses it and it does a wheelie through the streets. But it's, I just love the like, oh, that's fine. It's a company car. Ring! <laughs> Yep, this is like a pretty good chase scene. They're like ninjas, basically. I don't know what else to call them. That's sort of what they are. A bunch of guys in black martial arts outfits with all sorts of martial arts weapons show up driving a jeep and they accost everyone on the tuk-tuk and vj starts hitting them with a tennis racket uh, you know bond gets in a fight bond proceeds to get stabbed in the chest by one of these guys before punching him out and then he pulls the bladed weapon out of his jacket we discover that of course it got blocked by the money that he had stuffed in his pocket moments before he pulls the wad of cash out and then just hurls it out the back of the car and it lands in the tray of a beggar at the side of the road yeah like so this scene is full of that kind of thing yeah it's like it's a weird it's such a weird this is a, like a really totally inconsistent scene because they they constantly undermine the excitement of it because like during the bit where vj is beating them all with the tennis racket we have this cut to the crowd as they all look one way and then back to vj hitting them with a racket and then the crowd like looking the other way as if they're watching a tennis match and then like the money going into the beggars bowl and there's a bunch of little jokey joke things that happen in this mm -hmm. that basically one of them would have been fine <laughs> but they're all so silly and contrived that it undermines the excitement of the scene yeah and it's also just like check off all the boxes you know like we've had the beggar then they jump off a bunch of boards ramping off a camel and then they go into the next scene where there are bits involving a fire eater a sword swallower and a man on a bed of nails oh and someone walking on hot coals you know it's yes yeah. yeah. Now, there is evidently one interesting piece of trivia about this fight scene, though. During the scene where Bond is being accosted by the guy with the knife glove, uh -huh. a cyclist rides through shot and not like a cross shot. He's like riding down the road in the wrong direction. The Jeep and the Tuk Tuk have to swerve around him and make way as he cycles through shot between them, between the two vehicles. Yeah. That was apparently a bystander who had no idea that things were being filmed. Yep. And they just happened to catch it and kept it in the film. It's pretty great. <laughs> I, I'm just, like, impressed with the stunt drivers. That's good on them. And everybody continuing the fight long enough after that happens for the shot to continue. Yeah, I assume that the drivers were local who, like the cyclist, are just used to putting up with whatever garbage might be encountered in traffic. I guess so. I don't know. I, I feel like... 
you know, I'm I'm a relatively avid cyclist, and I like to think that if I saw a jeep and a, a small taxi cab having a sword fight in front of me, I might, you know, steer around. That's fair. <laughs> I might not try to, to go between them. So in the market, among other things, Bond judo flips one of the guys onto a bed of nails, and the guy who was previously lying on the bed of nails yells in subtitles, get off my bed. He pulls a sword out of a sword swallower's mouth and uses it to fight someone else after the fight, handing it back to the sword swallower, saying, you'd better put that one back yourself. And then they run off the soundstage and back to a location. That sequence was on soundstage, by the way. (laughs) So they get back into the tuk-tuks. Bond asks VJ for the money that he gave him, opens up the wads of bills and hurls it into the streets yelling rupees and the street fills with people picking up all the rupees to stop their pursuers. And they manage to get away by driving directly through a movie poster, a replacement movie, a replacement but slightly different movie poster for which... (laughs) lowers down on a bizarre device sort of it's very batman obscuring their escape and gobinda and his thugs are like what happened what what, okay and then they run away leaving bond and vj to their business and their business is they have arrived at the mi6 station house where q has taken up residence to outfit bond with whatever he may need for his mission in india there's a funny little bit where while they were running around bond had a flower necklace placed on him and as soon as he walks in q is slightly bent over dealing with something so bond puts the necklace on q and then q stands up and puts it on vj (laughs) q is particularly salty in this one yeah which i like he's like how can i be expected to maintain the quality of my inventions if i am constantly called at a moment's notice out to the field to support your antics we're, we're getting we're leaning in at this point into q being resigned to being a field agent and not too pleased about it i only just noticed that vj eventually passes the flowers off to one of the technicians <laughs> they pause to watch q test a i guess a incursion device it's like because again much like the snake charming the sort of playing a flute and having a rope mystically move about is yet another indian street performance stereotype and so this is one that raises on its own with enough power to support a human being on it and it ends up breaking and q's sort of annoyed that it didn't quite pan out and then we see smithers again this is the same guy that had the broken arm testing a door knock for a door covered in spikes that swings open and slams a mannequin against the wall to which bond quips smashing work yeah i'm curious you know what's funny is like especially compared to what you think of with traditional sort of james bond fare the stakes currently in this movie are pretty low mostly because we don't know what the stakes are yeah we the audience have seen the scene with General Orlov being like, I want to dominate Europe. But that's sort of in a vacuum at the moment. Bond is following up on this because it was obviously important enough to kill 009. Mm -hmm. But we don't really know anything. Yeah, like right now, it's just MI6 investigating a Fabergé egg forgery ring. Yeah. So Q puts a microphone bug tracker location homing device into the Fabergé egg because it might become relevant. And he shows Bond a fountain pen that dispenses acid. Upon receiving this pen, Bond makes a quip, which is be handy for uh, dealing with a poison pen letter. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the term a poison pen letter? Uh, I think I basically got it from context. So I had to look it up. It's, It's just it's a rude letter. Yeah. Typically sent anonymously. Okay. It's a note that is unpleasant or abusive according to wikipedia yeah i I figured it was basically like a venomous communication to another person yeah what's funny to me about that moment is that that exact quip was used by peter sellers as evelyn tremble in casino royale 1967 (laughs) oh no yeah the same joke was used when he was presented <laughs> by Q Division with the pen that emits poisonous gas. And right. in that scene, he says, I suppose it'd be useful if you wanted to write A, and the other guy cuts him off with a poison pen letter. Yes, all our new recruits say that. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's like in that movie, in Casino Royale of all movies, it was presented as a bad joke. Yeah. And here's <sighs> Roger Moore using it in all seriousness. Perfect. <sighs> Well, if that had to happen in any Bond movie, this is surely the one it would happen in. Yeah, the one where it is immediately preceded with Bond, again, who is really looking his age, acting like a 12-year-old. Creating what I would describe as a hostile workplace. Holy crap, right? <laughs> He has his, like, homing watch, right? Well, Bond is presented with another gadget that Q's been working on, which is an upgraded version of his watch, which has a liquid, like, full-color liquid crystal television display. Bond walks over to a camcorder that is on a tripod in the corner of the room, while VJ and Q are, like, minding their own business, doing, like, looking at gadgets and whatnot. Bond walks over, looks at this camera, peers into it, notices that it's broadcasting to all the televisions in the room, proceeds to point it at one of the, the female employees working in the room zooms in on her breasts and cleavage and proceeds to do like one of those like back and forth zoom racks whip woo whip woo whip woo then sort of looks over kind of smug and self-satisfied as q basically is like stop acting like an adolescent 007 which like okay he got told to stop acting like an adolescent, sure, but he then proceeds to leave the camera focused well, on this woman's boobs for the remainder of the scene as she continues to sit there with a television over her shoulder behind her and a television in front of her, both displaying her chest for the entire room to see. To her credit, she just sort of rolls with it. She sort of scowls at Bond a little bit as we get this like wide shot of her sitting at a desk and two separate monitors showcasing her chest to the room. And she makes no attempt to move. And on the one hand, fair play to you, you shouldn't have to. Yeah. On the other hand, it's so odd that she, she... It's not that she doesn't even like try to cover herself. It's that she remains motionless. I assume is because she was probably an extra with no lines. And was told to stand perfectly still so that the cameras stay focused on your boobs the whole time. Yeah, but I will choose to believe it's a power play. I want to live in that world. Yeah. Anyhow, the scene ends. Bond has had his jacket repaired and has received his new gadgets and he exits and we, we enter our next scene where he, he walks into the hotel dining room at the pool and sits down at Magda's table. She has decided to join him for dinner after all. Yeah, because he's walking through and the concierge is like, oh, your table's ready. He's like, I didn't, what, my table? And like, yes, your your date's already there. And he's, uh -huh, what? Well, okay. And so, yeah, he goes and goes and sits down and they immediately go to the bedroom. Like this, Magda is just like, we're on the fast track here. And so they're immediately making out in the bed, drinking champagne. He spots that she has a tattoo of a blue ringed octopus. And she says, yes. That's my little octopus, ain't and he goes, Mur. he makes a face of like, that's a weird phrase to say. I hope no one ever thinks to name a movie that. <laughs> there are a couple of lewd lines in this scene, because when we cut to them in bed, they are clearly already post-coital, yeah. right? They've already done the deed. They're hanging out in bed, having champagne. I think they're post and pre-coital. I think they're existing in a... Well, well yes, because <laughs> Magda's line upon discovering their glass is empty is... I need refilling. Oh, God. <laughs> So Bond sort of like nods to that and then realizes that she's talking about the drink and goes and grabs the bottle of wine. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Sometime later, he regains consciousness. She is not inconspicuously stealing the Fabergé egg. He's completely aware of this, but that's fine because that's sort of part of the plan. She's wearing a sari and walks over to the balcony and ties it off, unknown to Bond. And then she backs over the balcony and uses the fabric from the sari to sort of lower herself to ground level, like people who do sort of the fabric aerials. Mm -hmm. And she did her own stunt. Did she? Which is neat. Yeah. In two different locations because the, the interior was on a was on a set. Huh. I'm not convinced that the knot she tied 
would hold. Probably not. No. That's that is my only lack of suspension of disbelief here. I believe the rest of it, but I don't believe the Nachi tide would hold. On the ground, Khan is there in a car, and Bond sort of nods at him like, "Oh, well, fair play." As he takes the egg and goes inside, Bond goes back into his room and gets knocked out by Gobinda. The opulent boat that we saw earlier, which is being rowed entirely by voluptuous women is transporting kamal khan to the floating island the floating palace what do they call it i think they call it the floating palace because it was the moon the monsoon palace i'm sorry i said moon palace earlier the monsoon palace and the yeah. the floating palace it's a, it's a couple of palaces kamal khan is led through again there are no men anywhere he is led to the room of the woman known as octopussy he is very happy that he has retrieved the actual Fabergé egg. And she's like, cool, but the original was still lost. So that's a problem. What are we going to do about that? And he's like, well, you know, we're working on it. Also, there's this guy who's been following us around. You know, I'm going to deal with him, too. She's like, oh, yeah, who's he? And Khan says, ah, some British agent named Bond. We don't see her face at this point, but this she's feeding her fish. And this gives her pause. She like freezes in the middle of feeding the fish when she hears that, when she hears the name. And then is like, actually... Don't kill him. Bring him here. I'd like to meet this guy. Khan's like, I, I, I was really going to torture him for information and then kill him. I still really want to do that. Can I can I torture him and kill him, please? <laughs> she says, no, you get, get some information if you want, but then bring him here. And he's like, OK, but you're making a big mistake. This guy's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Back at Khan's palace, Bond is woken up in bed in his cell because he has been kidnapped and taken to the monsoon palace. And he's woken up by his watch pinging that, hey, the egg's getting closer because Kamal Khan is arriving back from Octopussy's different other palace. Bond sort of looks around his room, realizes he's stuck in there. There's bars over the windows. He sees Khan arrive and Gobinda is at the door and informs him that dinner will be at eight o'clock. And that's it. He just is like, dinner will be at eight and locks him in there. So it's eight and Bond is changed into a tuxedo with which he's been provided. It's amazing that people keep giving him nice things to wear. And it's dinner time. And at this table with an amazing spread is Magda and Kamal Khan. Khan makes some sort of, he's like, I believe you already know Magda. And what does Bond, Bond make some sort of gross joke about like, oh yeah, we done it. Khan just sort of lets that glance off him. Magda doesn't seem too bothered by it either. They're having a souffle for appetizers. Bond gets like one bite into his souffle before dinner is served and they take it away from him as well. Yeah, which is steamed sheep's head. It sure is. Bond responds to it much the same way I would, which is he's sort of directing his quip both at the sheep's head and at Gobinda, but says something to the effect of like, I, I tend to lose my appetite when I'm being stared at. Because there's this weird crash zoom in on Gobinda. It goes like, like really close in on him. It's a questionable cinematography choice. <laughs> But yeah, the sheep's head sure is. The presentation is, this is not how sheep's head is made. Look, I don't, I've never had it. I have not had steamed sheep's head. But I know from a cursory, just a base level amount of research that it is not, generally speaking, prepared and presented <laughs> like a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> which is what it is here certainly yeah it doesn't have the eyeballs lolling out the sockets yeah kamal khan in fact just plucks an eyeball out and takes a bite out of it and bond looks really grossed out by that apparently the prop was made of marzipan ah all right that makes me feel better yeah same <laughs> what's the actual purpose of this scene there isn't one he like has them for dinner what do they even talk about they just sort of like natter back and forth at one another here and they basically just suss each other out in this scene kamal khan is like we want information from you and it'll be much easier if you just talk to us and bond is like well what if i don't want to talk kamal khan is like well we have we have options we could make that happen then they basically just have this sort of back and forth about how they would proceed to make him talk bond is like so so what are you talking like hot pokers and he's like no no we like to be much more sophisticated than that and he's like ah so sodium pentothal then and he's like nah it's unreliable we can't trust that it will work and then he names some other chemical compound he's like no no, no. we we prefer a mixture of two other chemical compounds one of which is like a nerve toxin from the octopus and bond is like ah i see which is quite effective but leaves the victim with permanent brain damage. And Kamal Khan is like, yes, exactly. It's an unfortunate side effect, but we do find that it's most effective. And then that's basically it. They're like, all right, dinner's over. 
we've had our chat. Why don't you retire for the evening and we'll get started tomorrow? He's so polite. Bond asks Magda if she'd be interested in a nightcap, but Gobinda just puts his hand between them, you know, and she's like, uh, no, I'm fine. Thanks. And Gobinda takes Bond back to his own room where Bond's like, why well, you want to come in for a nightcap? And Gobinda does not seem interested. <laughs> I think Bond just wants someone to hang out and have a drink with. Yeah. Got to be lonely in a cell. Well, not for long, because he uses the acid in his pen to break the bars and uh, start to make his escape by sort of going around the outside of the building where he is, for the second movie in a row, startled by a dove. You'd think he'd check for doves first. Yeah, it wouldn't be the last time either. This is a thing that John Glenn did to Bond in every movie he directed, being startled by a bird and having it give away his position yeah so bond sneaks around past magda's room spends a little too long watching her undress but carries on as the building is then flooded with light as a helicopter is arriving bond is sort of caught out in the open manages to hide somewhere and sees that general orlov is getting out of the helicopter and talking with khan and gobinda and he can't quite suss out exactly why but he sneaks around follows them and because they still have the egg nearby he's able to listen in on them essentially khan has someone here making all of the fake jewelry orlov is swapping the fake jewelry with the real jewelry at the kremlin art repository and then they're gonna sell the real jewelry for a whole bunch of money mm-hmm. that is the extent of the plan as we know it at this time there's a bit where bond doesn't get the whole plan because Magda turns on her hairdryer for some reason, and that interferes with the signal. But that's the crux of the scene. Right. Bond almost gets discovered and hides in a walk-in freezer where there are two people that they have killed, I guess. We don't know who these people are. They're just people Khan has killed. Eventually, people come to take them out in body bags. So Bond hides in one of the body bags by way of getting out of the palace. Right. Because Orlov smashed the Fabergé egg, I don't know if he thought it was the real one or not, but... Orlov smashed the egg and Khan spotted the tracking device bug, but didn't tell Orlov. Yeah. And that doesn't have any bearing on anything. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's weird. This whole sequence is weird because like Khan has the real egg at this point. It is the real egg they smash, right? Yeah. Bond stole the real egg and replaced it with a fake and then lost the real one to Magda when she left the room. But that was intentional because the real one had the bug in it. And then Orlov is like, well, we don't need this fake anymore and smashes it. But it has the bug in it, which then Khan sees and is like, oh, he's got a bug. And then it isn't really super relevant after that. No, there's no payoff for Khan to know that. Nothing happens. Yeah. Khan is like, go get Bond. Gobinda finds that he's missing. Khan says, great. Well, we get to have a hunt. They get ready to the most dangerous game. They go, they're going to go hunt man on the backs of elephant. <laughs> the body bags get taken outside. The first one gets thrown into a mass grave and they grab Bonds and he sits up and goes, whoa. And the two men are startled and he busts out of his body bag and runs away. And Before that happens, there's a little gag that I like. So I want to comment on it, which is they, they heft the first body up onto a cart and it just goes thump. And then they heft the second body bag up onto a cart and it goes and they both look at each other and then he sits up and spooks them so he runs away and a bunch of people shoot at him and khan goes oh great well now we know where he is all right here we go and then there is an extended sequence of bond running around he runs into some really painfully fake spider webs with giant tarantulas in them he encounters a clearly (laughs) artificial tiger all the while Kamal Khan and Gobinda are chasing him on the backs of elephants. Bond tells the tiger to sit, and the tiger sits. I don't know how that works. I guess maybe this is a slightly domesticated tiger. We'll give the movie the benefit of the doubt there. It's just, he was really intense about it. He was. He goes, sit With his finger in the air. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, this goes on forever. It's a long, long, long jungle chase sequence. Which is improved in zero ways. <laughs> by a very bad Tarzan reference as Bond swings from vine to vine through the treetops accompanied by the classic Tarzan scream 
the like oh, 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 oh like that sound clip which is trademarked by the way really yeah i guess it would be i learned about it on an episode of under the influence which is a terrific cbc podcast that, that is a great podcast it's so yeah. good if you like advertising and marketing it's fascinating it's called under the influence with terry o'reilly it's very good there's an episode on audio trademarks which is fascinating and that's one of them anyway it's terrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bad, bad shot. But it does lead to Bond finally being able to get away as he lands in the swamp, picks up a leech, has to, like, tear the leech off, make his escape from alligators and crocodiles alike, and he sees a tour boat. And he's, like, taking fire from the hunters through all this, but he sees a tour boat off in the distance. And so he runs out into the open in sight of all these tourists and just says, Hey, help! The boat sort of pulls over and he climbs aboard as the, the hunters leave him alone. He clamors aboard this tour boat, and one of them is like, oh, are, we, are you with our tour? He's like, no, I'm with the economy group. <laughs> that is that is actually a good line. This is a day tour for Cincinnati Moose Lodge 183. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that it's a bunch of like it's a bunch of Americans just being like, "Oh, hey, what's up?" So we cut back to Q's place where Bond is talking to the head of Station I, describing the blue ringed octopus. VJ is giving him a rub down, which is kind of weird, but whatever. And Bond is determined to get back to the floating palace because the blue ringed octopus is a symbol of a smuggling group, which they believe is based on this floating palace, but they've never really been able to do anything about it. And also it hasn't really been that important. Right. So seagull hat or crocodile submersible. <laughs> Crocodile submersible is really good. <laughs> it's pretty good. It, it's so goofy. We get this clearly fake crocodile floating through the water around the sort of like the edges of the floating palace. And then its upper jaw hinges up on a little hydraulic lift to a 90 degree like vertical orientation. And we can see that there's a little windscreen inside its mouth. You can just sort of see from the nose up, Bond is hidden inside this crocodile, peering out of its mouth through this little windscreen, and he sort of perks up and looks around and then drops back in, and then the mouth hinges back closed as he proceeds forward. He then proceeds to infiltrate the floating palace and, and sneak around. He's not as stealthy as he thinks he is. He's basically caught immediately. He makes his way into Octopussy's room, and before he can even get in, she's spotted him on the CCTV cameras that she has installed. So he comes through the door with his gun drawn, and she's like ah welcome how are you totally unfazed by his arrival and she turns around to finally reveal her face and it's Maud adams not the same character as in man with a golden gun obviously and but she is very striking honestly she's great in this role uh, and this role sucks yeah like Maud adams is doing great work with what she's given but this character has nothing to do this character just has other people doing things around her yeah hundred percent. You are absolutely correct. I think in this scene, we get what is meant to be a fair bit of exposition, but it doesn't help a whole lot. Yeah. We learn, for instance, the reason she knows James Bond is because Bond caught her father having like been a traitor or having like done something upon getting the story from her father decided to like let him commit suicide rather than killing him himself for reasons bond is like oh so you want revenge she's like no i wanted to meet the man who like gave my father the choice basically yeah he allowed her father to commit a noble suicide rather than be That's right. arrested and tried for treason i guess yeah and so she's sort of like oh there's no hard feelings there and like we learn that she's been keeping this this like island of women and training them in various nefarious arts and operating this like jewel smuggling ring that's it it like we don't really get a good integration of what she's doing and why we get a little bit of character backstory and then we get mostly information that we were already up to speed with because they have already shown it to us in the film and then they are interrupted by kamal khan who is led into the room by two of octopussy's higher ranking hench people and you can tell because of how they're dressed yeah costumes in this so you know the cat in the hat <laughs> it shouldn't surprise me that you went the same way 
with these costumes than I did because I don't Good. know how you could look at these costumes and see anything other than thing one and thing two. Yeah. They are full red spandex bodysuits with a white circular emblem emblazoned on the chest. They're so bad. Thing one and thing two and thing three and thing four through thing 37. The hench people are, well, all hench women in this case, are all wearing this same outfit. It is striking. It's unmistakable. It's ridiculous. It does not look good. Kamal Khan comes in with a full head of steam and is like, look, Bond has escaped. This is really bad. And she's like, oh, that's a shame. Anyway, have you met my new house guest? It's James Bond. What's up? Khan is like, you have, you're, you, this is a bad idea. It's a bad idea. And she's like, ah, you know, I'll take my chances. And he's like, okay, goodbye then. As soon as he leaves, he gets a look on his face of like, ooh, James Bond. <laughs> Bond and Octopussy talk a little bit about the blue ringed octopus, which is very poisonous, which is true. And then she says, all right, you can stay here because I don't actually have a problem with you. After Bond is shown out and to his room, she says, let him do whatever he wants, but double the guards. Yeah, she asks Midge to do that, I believe. I'm given, to, I, I name the character specifically because I'm given to understand there's something of like a minor internet fandom for Midge. The smallest guard? The, the small one with the enormous brown hair. Huh. But uh, yeah, that's Midge. She's named, again, unforgettable <laughs> in appearance in her little thing one outfit. The larger blonde one is named Gwendolyn. I don't know why Gwendolyn as the larger thing does not simply eat Midge. <laughs> But we may never know as Kamal Khan <laughs> and Gobinda find their way to some sort of seedy bar full of unscrupulous folks where they are looking to hire someone to kill James Bond. Khan offers an amount of money and they're like, well, no, we don't want to make an enemy of her. And Khan offers more money and they go, yeah, all right, sure. And among them is a man with a circular saw yo-yo. <laughs> It is a circular saw yo-yo. It's a very silly weapon. It's a very, very silly weapon. It seems like it'd be very easy to injure yourself with using. It also just seems really impractical because we see him use it in the film and he can only use it vertically. He must be positioned above the person he's trying to kill. If you if you get on an even plane with him, you've won. He can no longer hurt you. Yeah. We have a brief shot of Q pretending to fish as he watches with binoculars across to the floating palace. Bond and Octopussy are just sort of wandering around. She says that she's got to take off, but hopes that Bond will hang around and they can hang out some more when she gets back. And it's then nighttime and VJ comes to spell Q out. And VJ's like, how long do you think he'll be? And Q's like, on an island? of women uh, we'll be lucky if we ever see him again <laughs> bond is sort of poking around octopussy's place and finds a flyer for octopussy's circus in karl markstad in east germany good old family fun yeah because octopussy doesn't just do jewel smuggling she has a lot of legitimate businesses as well one of which is a circus which is a strange choice but sure well i guess if you're training a bunch of people in the acrobatic arts like she is there's transferable skills yeah i mean what we sort of have haven't talked about is that she set up this island as a place to train and rehabilitate and be a home for underprivileged women by teaching them how to crime but now not all of them crime some of them circus <laughs> She has multiple industries that she works in. It's it's a weird set of industries, too, because there's like a comment at one point that like she has diversified her business ventures to like importing and exporting jewel smuggling and circuses. Sure. Why not? That's a very diverse portfolio. I agree. So the flyer that Bond finds for the circus identifies that the next destination of the circus is going to be Karl Markstadt, as you noted. We now note that the the circus is important because the I, like the character that they use to represent the circus on this advertising magazine is none other than the clown that we saw 009 dressed up as at the outset of the film. Mm -hmm. There's no mistaking that that he was running from Octopussy's Circus in its previous stop in East Berlin. One thing we sort of glossed over in a previous scene was when Orlov and Kamal Khan and Gobinda are all talking about the egg just before Orlov smashes it. They agree to meet in one week's time in Karl Markstadt. So we now have 
two instances of like everything is heading to Karl Marx stat in a week. It seems like that's going to be important. Do you recall why they get into a disagreement in this scene, Bond and Octopussy? Because Bond says he's not going to promise that he'll still be there in a week. Right. She's like, I have to go away on business, but I'll be back in a week. I hope you're still here. And he says, I don't promise. Like, I can't promise that I will be. And she gets upset at that. And they solve this disagreement by heavy makeouts and sex yes although not in a happy way to start no she storms out of the room bond follows her and grabs her and then she looks shocked and surprised and then they kiss and then she's like oh yeah all right and then they go for it yeah there's i think there's meant to be more sexual tension between them than is coming across probably yeah i don't know yeah (laughs) it's it's tough to say like octopussy's characterization is very cool and calculating and like business oriented and like you know she's a sexy woman but she doesn't she clearly likes bond she doesn't have any like she doesn't have anything against him their whole interaction to this point has been mostly just sort of like chatting idly about business in an amicable way but not in a sexy way like i don't know it it's it, this is a little uncomfortable to me like she's clearly being like i hope you're still here because i think there could be something he's like well i can't know <laughs> i got other stuff to do and she's like well screw you then and storms out and then he storms in after her and like throws himself at her against her protestations initially and then she just sort of relents and we get this long shot of them lying on the bed in the most like awkward position like nothing about this is sexy it's just awkward <laughs> and briefly unpleasant like despite so despite what you said which i agree with despite your sort of read on her characterization i got the impression from their discussions that she was basically sort of down for this the whole time like when i mentioned sexual tension i i meant the sort of classic will they or won't they and that was not present what i what i experienced watching this was a sort of a why haven't they yet Mm. (laughs) yeah are you two not gonna did you already and we just didn't see it like what what's going on here and then yeah then the scene as you describe is it just seems so odd and it's such a weird thing for her to get mad about to the point of storming out of the room and then why why he grabs her it's yeah like i definitely get the she's dtf the entire time so to speak Mm -hmm. because like the way she presents herself is like she likes him and the reason she wants him to be there when she comes back is because she sees bond as relationship potential and you know i would like to do it with you so stick around can't do it now but when i come back oh boy we're gonna do it and then he's like well no and she she then sort of like runs off spurned is how that scene like how the scene reads to me right it is like out of character for her it does not flow the way she has been depicted to this point that is not how she would react to being spurned in that way but the whole situation is a contrivance because you're right the open question is like well why haven't you two boned down already Mm -hmm. as i say the whole scene is just awkward (laughs) it is it's 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 very awkward then we cut back to vj who's fishing and watching the island and he hears a sound off of shot so he stands up and looks around some mooks come out of the bushes and grab him the mook with the saw blade yo-yo is standing on top of this like bridge staircase apparatus and they they just hold him in place so that yo-yo guy can yo-yo poor vj poor vj and vj gets yo-yoed you gotta have a lot of faith in your yo-yo guy to be standing to be holding vj a man who is struggling to be holding him that close and be confident that you're not going to get yo-yoed yourself. Yeah, it seems like a good way to lose an arm, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, there's got to be some collateral yo-yoing has happened over the years. I don't know. Yeah, we get this shot. Bond wakes up in the middle of the night and starts to get dressed. We get this shot of water outside the palace with some weeds that are drifting a little weirdly. Bond, you know, he walks to the, the window and looks out and he sees some birds take off flying. And then we see the mooks, including our friend Yo-Yo Guy, emerge from the water, having been hidden underneath the reeds, and they begin to invade the floating palace. Bond goes back, basically, like, wishes Octopussy well, 
they start to make out and as they are making out bond gets hit with a drop of water realizing that yo-yo guy is on the the landing above the bed and manages to throw octopusy off the bed and leap off the bed himself in time to avoid getting yo-yoed and uh, then we have a fight scene as bond takes on the two mooks and uh, yo-yo guy up on the landing above the bed just keeps yo-yoing things and mostly missing people yeah it's like it's a it's a perfectly serviceable fight scene marred by the fact that the circular saw yo-yo is really stupid yeah like i remembered it it's memorable but in the fight scene it's like the guy is like lucky that octopussy's bedroom has a mezzanine yeah because he spends the whole time just running around the mezzanine trying to get in position to use his dumb weapon and it's like like a machete would be so much more versatile. Yeah, and effective. Yeah. Or, may I pitch you this one, a gun. (laughs) A gun is, in fact, how Octopussy resolves the fight scene by her armed guards running into the room and she grabs a gun from one of them and shoots a guy. She uses a stun dart, but yeah, a gun definitely would help here. That's also stupid that the person with a gun runs in and rather than just let them do their job, she's like, give me that. Patoo! One guy in the fight scene gets like face hugged by Octopussy's octopus. That's fun. He gets his face put into the tank and gets face huggered. That's fun. The scene ultimately resolves as Bond and one of the mooks dive out the window into the water down below. And we see them fighting in the water. And then we see an alligator involved. And we hear this cry. The thrashing of the water subsides and, and neither Bond nor the mook are here to be seen. So Octopussy, who had been trying to shoot the guy that was attacking Bond, Bond is unable to help, and she resigns herself to the fact that both Bond and the Mook have met their fates at the business end of an alligator. I think it's a crocodile. It could be a crocodile. I can never tell them apart. I know there are ways to tell them apart. I know somebody now in chat is going to say, oh, you can tell them apart because a crocodile has a rounder snout and an alligator has a pointier snout. But I <laughs> See, can you never know these things. Straight. You know the thing. <laughs> first of all, first of all, you can tell we both stream too much because you said chat and it took me a solid 10 seconds before I was like, I think he means Sorry, the, the comments. comments. Yeah, exactly. I do mean the comments. <laughs> Two, you know the thing. Those are the things. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, if I'm only seeing one or the other of the two creatures and don't have both an alligator and a crocodile in front of me to compare. All right. Fair enough. They both just just look like arrow shaped heads. So I, I it's either. OK, well, that one's got a sort of like pointy looking head. Maybe it's an alligator, but I don't know. Maybe it's round enough to be a crocodile. <laughs> I can't couldn't tell you. I need to put a a crocodile and an alligator next to each other and they can be like oh that one's the crocodile all right fair enough yeah (laughs) the fact is this is neither of those things because it's his submarine i don't know how it moved there because there's a shot of it moving and it's like swimming through the water and like thrashing and then when we see it again it's completely rigid and it's like i don't for a second believe (laughs) that this stupid submarine moved like that Bond takes Croco Sub back to the shore where Q has just discovered VJ. VJ is dead, which is sad, but was alive when Q found him. Which is also sad. Which is also sad, and was able to pass on that it was Kamal's men that did this, which I guess Bond probably could have sussed out. So now they're in Germany. Well, Bond is in Germany, in West Germany, with M. I don't know why M would be there, but M is with him there in a car, and they're driving towards the border. I also thought it was weird that M was in the car. Yeah, why would M be so close to the border in West Germany? Yeah, I. what gets me is that they, like, they pull up at the curb just before the border checkpoint, and then M gets out of the car and walks across the street that Bond then takes across the bridge into East Berlin. Like, M gives him his documents and whatever, right? is like this is who you are and this is your reason to to be crossing into to east germany but if i'm i don't know maybe the local border checkpoint guards don't know i i mean i guess it's reasonable to assume that the checkpoint guards don't know what the head of british secret service looks like but i don't know if it feels like an unnecessary risk because if you drop an agent off in a car and the head of British Secret Service gets out of the car and walks away and you happen to know, huh, I think that's the head of British Secret Service. Stop that car. I have exactly the same thought. <laughs> Maybe get out of the car around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you didn't know who it was, if it's just like, 
that car came up to the checkpoint and a dude got out and then the car kept going. It's like, well, who is that dude? Why can't he come across? What's going on here? It's weird. It is weird. We cut to the circus. Bond arrives. We see Mishka and Grishka do their knife throwing act. Bond is watching and he sees in the audience Octopussy and Kamal Khan and General Orlov. And there's a bunch of East German troops there. I think this circus does tours of military bases. Yeah. There's some clowns. We see the human cannonball. Bond sees Octopussy sneak through the back. He grabs a discarded crew shirt. And then I guess, oh, I guess this is actually the next morning. He's now disguised as crew. I, I didn't grok right away that the performance is at night and then Bond grabs the jacket at night and then they're doing loadout the next morning. Yeah, the timeline from here on out is extremely difficult to follow. Dude, I had so much trouble with one of the things coming up. I was like, I've been actively watching this movie and I am lost right now. It makes no sense, but we'll get to that. Bond sees them loading up one of the train cars for the circus train because the circus travels by train and General Orlov gets on board and Bond is confused. And we cut back to the Kremlin art repository and General Gogol is there and they inspect the Star of Russia a piece of jewelry, and they determine that it's a fake. And then we cut to the real star being inspected by Octopussy, who confirms it's real. They have a whole bunch of jewelry in this metal cylinder that they are hiding in a secret compartment in the base of the human cannonball cannon, which one of the twins welds into place. Right. Their plan is to smuggle it in there across the border checkpoint so they can sell the jewels in Switzerland. Right. At least that's what Octopussy thinks the plan is. Yes. It seems like everybody else is aware of a different plan. Yes. This plan, though, itself doesn't make a ton of sense. Yeah. They're in East Berlin right now. They're going to Karl Marxstadt. Where is Karl Marxstadt? I assume that's still in the Soviet Union. This is the Karl Marxstadt show. Oh. They're in East Berlin now. They've just done it. Now they're going to an American Air Force base in West Germany. Of course. Right. So that will get them across the... Very good. Okay, I'm I'm back up to speed. You're right. They are smuggling the jewels across the border. Yeah, to get it out of the... Between East, East Berlin and West Berlin. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Bond is hiding under the train car, and they've left Gobinda and Ishka on the, one of the Ishkas on the train car. And they tell Octopussy and Khan and Orlov to get off so they can connect it to the main train. And they back it into a tunnel. And God, I was so confused. And the fact that there's twins does not help. <laughs> In the tunnel is a second identical train car into the human cannons cannon of which is being welded a nuclear bomb. Yes. And they're switching the train car because the actual plan is that they're going to set that bomb off at the Air Force Base to start World War III. It's, it's actually not to start World War III. There's another layer to this plan. They are going to set off a seemingly American 100 kiloton nuclear weapon at the nuclear missile base so that nuclear disarmament movements in Europe call for the disarmament of American military bases because it will appear like an accident. Right. So that they can then run uncontested across Western Europe. Right. Without fear of nuclear reprisal. Sometimes a Bond movie needs a really good villain monologue <laughs> to explain this is all one of those that. times? I think so. I was watching this scene. I was so baffled by the alternate train car and because i was like okay yeah they got to hook it up to the main line sure and then they go back there and there's a different twin still welding and i'm like wait are they opening it up no they actually have a different train car and orlov and khan and gobinda and the twins are all on board for this plant they're all totally aware of what's happening here the only person who doesn't know what's going on is Octopussy, who thinks she's just smuggling some jewels. Right, because she's just being used by this whole, like, her drug smuggling operation is being used by all these people to actually execute the, the real plan. Or uh, jewel smuggling. Yeah. What did I say? 
drug smuggling oh sorry jewel smuggling you're you're correct so like one of the other confusing things in this scene is that like bond breaks into the the now disconnected car and sees the other twin re-welding like now cutting the jewel canister out of the second cannon so that like they put the jewel canister in the first cannon they sealed it in by welding then they switched cars we see them sealing the nuclear bomb into cannon number two that car gets attached to the train and the train begins to go bond goes and gets into the first train car that is now left behind and sees the twin that got left behind cutting the jewels back out of the thing because now that they have done the switch and the jewel smuggling is all dealt with they can just make off with the jewels so they've decided to just sort of like take the jewels i guess yeah for their own purposes octopusy no longer matters at this point to their plan i don't think so maybe maybe they're gonna just take them and put them back in the kremlin like maybe Maybe the ones in the Kremlin are only there to be fakes for as long as they need to borrow them. Right. That would make sense because they are like they are Russians working for the Russian military. Maybe like I'm I'm extrapolating. That's not made clear. I should say that us explaining this plan, we're explaining it much more succinctly and coherently than the movie does. Sometimes despite our best efforts. Well, it's just, I, <laughs> I, I just don't want I don't want people at home listening and going like, OK, I get the plan because it's like if you're watching this movie without that explanation, you may find yourself going like, well, why are they doing this? Yeah. Mishka or Grishka, whoever it is that's cutting the jewel tin open, pulls out the Russian star and happens to see Bond moving around behind him in the reflection of the jewel. So he turns around with his blowtorch and blowtorches Bond in the face. Bond manages to dodge, but not without getting blinded. Then there's a fight. They have a fight on a train car as Grishka or Mishka throws knives at Bond and Bond tries not to get a knife thrown at him. Bond ultimately diffuses the situation by kicking a lever. He falls over. The knife thrower dude gets into position to throw the knife at him and Bond kicks the lever on the the human cannonball cannon, dropping the cannon on his head, ostensibly killing him. Bond then takes his costume, stuffs his body into the cannon and then hoists the cannon back up so that nobody will know he's there. The little sort of tank engine comes and pushes that car back out of the tunnel to where the Russians are waiting to grab the jewels back. Orlov goes to check on the twin and it's Bond. So he holds Orlov at gunpoint. Orlov is very surprised. This is as close as we get to a villain monologue is Bond's like, why are you doing this? And this is where he explains like, oh, you know, so that they'll disarm all of the weapons and then we'll be able to run unopposed through Europe. Ha 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 ha. Bond is understandably upset at this. The door opens and there's a soldier there and Bond shoots him and there's a distraction and Orlov escapes out the back door that we previously hadn't seen. And then there's a big old gunfight. Bond manages to steal the Russian's car, peels off running after the train that he now knows has a bomb on it, runs the car over some spike strips, the kind of like ones on an angle that stop you from going the wrong direction in or out of a parking lot, completely destroying all the wheels on his car. He pilots (laughs) this car on rims over to a level crossing where the wheels find purchase on the train tracks they obviously had to custom modify the car to make this work and then he has a car driving on train tracks just hauling ass down the tracks after the train yeah my thought on, at, at the outset of this stunt was like oh convenient that this car's wheelbase was identical to the gauge of track they're using yeah he manages to pull up next to the train they go through a switch crossing the switchman sees this car hauling ass down the tracks and throws the switch so uh bond ends up on a parallel track to the train so he manages to get parallel with the back car uses an umbrella to force the pedals down to keep the car stable climbs out the sunroof of the car onto the roof just as he's about to make a jump onto the train another train going the other direction appears on his track so he he leaps at the last second getting out of the way of this train which obliterates the car that he was just on and he begins his infiltration of the now nuclear bomb laden train we have a quick bit of gobinda and the other non-murdered twin just being like orlov says we stay here with the bomb until we cross the border and then we cut back to general gogol who finds the russian car that had the jewels in the trunk it has been like fished out of a river yeah general gogol is on orlov he has orlov's number He's like, yeah, he's like Inspector Zenigata in this. He's just like right on Orlov the whole time. 
Yeah. So he sees this he's, and puts two and two together basically immediately and is like, all right, take me away in the helicopter. There's a extended sequence of the train at the border crossing where they're being inspected. A very cursory inspection considering it's an entire train. Bond is hiding in the train car inside a gorilla suit. Don't worry about how he managed to get into the gorilla suit without the twin or Gobinda noticing him because he gets out of the suit way faster later and it makes even less sense. (laughs) So he's hiding in the suit. The train gets cleared to pass the checkpoint. So it does. The train begins to roll. And as it does, we get a shot back down the tracks of General Gogol's helicopter coming towards the train. And then as it's approaching, we see General Orlov's car fly across the train tracks at a crossing to the other side. And Orlov leaps out of his car and runs after the train busting through this border checkpoint which of course causes the soldiers to open fire on him so he gets shot in the back and falls down with the train passing beyond it and general gogol you know tells everybody to hold their fire and, and walks up basically they have their, their their last words with one another gogol is like you know what have you what have you done you've killed yourself you know you're a fool orlov is like well today i may be a fool but tomorrow i will be a hero and falls over dead general gogol looks towards the train that he was chasing after it has now passed across the border checkpoint into the west and is outside his reach nobody on the train seems to notice or care that a bunch of guns just got fired which is maybe more believable than the two guys driving the car in the pre-title sequence not realizing that the two guys in the back had their parachutes pulled why did the two guys in the back have parachutes on you know that's a much better question We may have to. All right. Well, okay. Let's start. Let's start at the beginning then. All right. (laughs) Rewind. Here's all the stupid things in this movie. So in the train car. Here's another stupid thing in this movie. In the train car. Bond is now still in the gorilla suit. (laughs) Khan and Gobinda and the twin set the timer for 345 in the afternoon, which is four hours from now. That's when the bomb is going to go off because that's about when the circus will be in the middle of the show. Gobinda thinks he hears something. He grabs a prop sword and takes the head off the gorilla suit, but Bond has somehow already gotten out of it and is halfway through the trap door up to the roof of the train, where we now get a big long sequence of running along the roof of the train. I really like the framing of, sorry, just to go back. I really like the framing of the shot of like Gobinda taking the head off the gorilla because it makes no sense, but it's a clever shot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because Bond is like in position climbing out the thing, but he's obscured by the head. And when the head comes off, that's when Bond is revealed like halfway through his escape. And then Gobinda looks over and sees Bond's legs like escaping out the top of the car from Gobinda's perspective, he should have been able to see those feet the entire time. But from the camera's perspective, behind the head of the gorilla, they're hidden. (laughs) So it makes for a dramatic shot that if you think about for two seconds, completely falls apart. This train sequence goes on for some time, and there are many really cool shots in it that I like, where you can clearly see Bond running around on the roof while Gobinda is running back and forth through the cars on the inside. Like, there are some shots where you can see all of that happen, and it's really cool generally it's sort of maybe goes on for a little bit but i don't know i I, for all i rag on the movie the the train sequence is pretty all right yeah it's pretty good i agree i don't want to get bogged down in a lot of specifics but i did like there's a part where the twin pokes his head up and sees gobinda fighting with bond with his back to him and he sees that bond is still wearing his brother's costume and so for a moment thinks it's his brother and is confused why gobinda is fighting with him but is happy to see him and then sees that it's bond and gets real mad Mm -hmm. so then there's three people on top of the train And, and that's basically where it ends bond and the twin get into a fight on top of the train they heave each other off the train leaving leaving gobinda behind atop the train and bond runs into the forest and and the twin pulls out a knife and we're like oh we're gonna retread the opening of the movie again as he chases bond through the forest throwing knives at him that doesn't happen bond finds this little cabin in the woods and goes to hide inside it and as he reaches for the door a knife by hitting his clothing 
pins his arm to the door. A couple of more knives fly from off screen, pinning Bond to the wall by his clothes. But Bond has already got a hold of the latch on the door. So when the twin comes over to murder him at last, Bond manages to swing the door open and, and the twin falls through the door. Bond frees himself and grabs a knife and throws it at him, killing the other twin and ending the, the fight, but leaving Bond stranded in the woods. Which means that he runs to the road, tries to hitch a ride in a car, which just blows past him and then sort of goes, oh, I guess I'm just running and then just takes off jogging down the road, still dressed like a circus performer. Possibly even sillier because he loses the leather vest and is now just wearing like this very floofy burgundy shirt. So the circus pulls into the Air Force base. They like parade through town because they're like, hey, come and watch the circus later at the thing. Cut back to Bond still not being able to convince anyone to give him a ride. Sorry, this is where the timeline loses me. Oh, yeah. Because as the parade is going through town, it's like the parade or the the circus is in town. Come to our show later. We get a shot of the timer on the bomb. Just one hour and 28 minutes left. Uh Uh-huh. When are they going to set up the circus? Oh, it's happened. How has it happened? The circus train has all the circus stuff on it. It is pretty ridiculous. I agree with you. (laughs) (laughs) Was there like a, a, a forward circus unit? I don't understand. It is very confusing to me. They disassembled the circus. They put it on the train. The train arrived. The train parades through town. They still have, like, to set the circus up. So anyhow, this all takes place. We presume that the circus gets set up. There's a tent. They they move all their stuff into the tent. Bond manages to actually land a ride with a cup, like a German couple that keep trying to feed him bratwurst and beer in the car. Bond, of course, is, like, focused intently on his watch through all this we we were just cutting back and forth between like bond trying to get to the circus and the circus setting up there's an adorable little tiger cub it's very cute okay so i've just i've done a google okay from karl markstad which has been renamed chemnitz in germany to feldstad which the sign in the parade says is where the air force base is is uh currently you can do it by train passing through berlin central station in Six hours, 45 minutes. Okay. They were already underway when they set the timer. They didn't set the timer until they went over the crossing. So I don't know how far exactly that is. But the point is they have to have gotten all the way there and constructed the tent Uh in like three hours. Because we see the tent fully built and the timer showing just about an hour. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with you. That seems... Not possible. Yeah. The couple driving Bond around pulls into a small German town square. Bond tries to run to the payphone, but he gets beaten to the payphone by a woman who desperately needs to make a phone call. He pleads with her in English to try and let her give him a turn at the phone. She refuses, so he just steals her car. (laughs) That gets her off the phone. It does get her off the phone. (laughs) It means that he's now being pursued by police yeah because there are cops in the square at the time when he takes the car so she immediately gets the cops on his case kamal khan and gobinda who are the only ones who know about this plan excuse themselves leaving octopussy sitting with the head of the american air force base there's a brief moment which i kind of like if gobinda turns the car on and it doesn't turn over the first time and khan <laughs> has this look on his face like holy crap and then he does it again and it runs fine he's like okay cool great drive bond while being pursued by by police eventually makes his way closer and closer to the air force base they actually pass khan and gobinda on the road and khan is recognizes him and is like surprised that bond is alive but then is like uh he's going towards the bomb that's fine cool he can die with the rest of them is that is that the scene where you were like gobinda gets told to do something and he's like really no no okay yeah is that still to come oh yeah there's still 20 minutes in this damn movie <laughs> Bond basically busts his way onto the Air Force base under pursuit of the police and the Air Force checkpoint guard waves the police through. So it's like everyone's after him at this point. He ditches the car and runs in between all of the circus RVs that are there because apparently it's not just the train. There's also a whole ton of caravans. I guess that's how they got the train set up or the tent set up. I guess so. It seems to defeat the purpose of having a train. Yeah. Why not just have it do it all with trucks if you're going to have to drive anyway (laughs) hey wait a minute this whole thing doesn't make sense yeah all right so bond hides from the many many people pursuing him by running into one of the dressing rooms and disguising himself as 
a clown, but not just any clown, the same clown that 009 disguised himself as at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. There's probably some sort of psychological study that could be done by MI6 about what made two 00 agents happen to choose... (laughs) <laughs> this same sad looking clown it was the title character of the of the circus yeah, i guess they're all egomaniacs they have to be the, the the character from the poster yeah that's the psychological trait so anyhow there's there's five minutes left on the bomb at this point yeah he manages to get inside the big top and then the guards notice his clothes in the dressing room and they realize that whoever it is is disguised as a clown and he's trying to get into the cannon but he's being buffeted around by all the other clowns and the the clown that's dressed like him the the cops grab the clown that's dressed like him and the human cannonball is annoyed because he bumped into him and thinks he's trying to upstage him everyone in the crowd thinks it's part of the show and they're loving it so bond eventually runs over to the head of the air force base and is like look there's a bomb in that thing and he's like ha 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 like no seriously and rips off his nose and hat he's like look i'm a british agent and says to octopussy not doesn't say her name because of course that would be weird have to explain that whole backstory because which we didn't even talk about that it was she has that name because her dad did a lot of stuff with marine life and this octopus in particular and he called her My his little, little octopusy. that's why that that's that's why she has that name i guess it's a weird thing yeah it's a weird thing for a father to call their daughter yes it's a weird thing it's a weird thing yeah i'm going to assume total innocence of it anyway sure he says look tell him who i am and she just sort of is wordless she's like and so he gives her the the star of russia and is like look does this convince you you know i heard orlov and khan talking about the plan they've set you up they're gonna blow the whole thing up they don't do anything so this was a waste of his time yeah so he just runs back over tries to get close to the thing gets a fire axe it does start a huge fight though it does which is what he manages to use to hit the thing to like try and break open the cannon in the middle of this, there's a shot of Magda leaning into Octopussy going, he's going to give the whole game away, which is like, huh? Well, they both think it's it's full of jewels, right? Yeah, but Octopussy doesn't do anything. So it's like she has this discord zone, like all it does is further stop her from acting on any part of the story. Yeah. I mean, she does momentarily have her like one moment of action, but like I sort of get what they're going for. Like it's not good or clear but as far as she knows the thing is full of jewels and he runs in is like there's a bomb in there we need to stop it and as far as she's concerned no there's no bomb she's never seen a bomb she doesn't know anything about a bomb this is nonsense he's made a mistake as far as she's concerned he is going to rat out her jewel smuggling so she doesn't let on because she doesn't want to be found out and she assumes they'll just take him away and she'll be fine but then the fight breaks out and he runs over and he He's like hitting the thing with the axe and then all the MPs come and like drag him away from it. And she sees how desperate he is. It's like, we are all going to die if you do not let me open this thing. There is a bomb in there. Holy crap. So she grabs a gun and shoots the lock because she realizes how desperately he is trying to do this. And she's like, well, she basically comes to a like better safe than sorry, shoots the lock, opening it, revealing the bomb, which everybody looks and turns to. Then they're like, oh crap there is a bomb the colonel is like all right defuse the bomb do do your thing go ahead and bond does so like all the character motivations work well enough for me in this scene they're just not clear all the pieces are there but they don't fit together really nicely (laughs) and the picture they paint isn't really coherent (laughs) yeah coherence is definitely an issue in this movie as a as a whole she does shoot the lock off the bomb is revealed there's like 12 seconds left on it the general barks to let bond go bond reaches down and pulls the detonator thing out and the little sort of detonator bolts fire out of it just as it's clear of the casing with one second left on the timer and everyone breathes a sigh of relief and then octopusy leans over to magda and says where is kamal going and she says well he's going back to india so then she and Octopussy leave. Bond is left so, suddenly ignored by everybody, left in his like crying clown makeup, standing there looking exhausted in the middle of this this circus. The, the, the fact that the clown makeup is like this visage of pained sorrow, it makes it way better. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then we get this announcement over the PA of like, all right, everybody, we've had a little emergency, but you're safe. It's all over now. If everybody could please calmly exit the tent. (laughs) That's definitely going to happen. So back in India, Kamal is burning a bunch of evidence as he prepares to, I mean, skip town, basically. He has counterfeit plates for different amounts of money. And he's like, oh, yeah, we'll need these. Got to print ourselves some cash wherever we're going to go. Because at this point, he knows it hasn't gone off. And so they need to run away. Gobinda hears a noise outside and looks down the road. And it's just that there, he says, women coming to sell themselves to the guards. Khan just goes, oh, cool. That'll just keep them more distracted. I don't want them to see me leave. Of course, it's not just any women. It's all of Octopussy's women. And so begins the... The climactic James Bond fight scene. Like opposing armies against one another. Yeah, except in this case, it's a whole bunch of Kamal's men versus a circus who all got to India real fast. It's interesting because there are three distinct types of costumes among the women in this invading militia force, right? There's the things. There's a contingent of women in brightly colored, like, silk. When I say, like, traditional Indian dancing garb, the stereotypical one is what comes to mind. The same things that Mata Bond was wearing in Casino Royale. Mm, Yeah. The, like, the Princess Jasmine outfit. And then there's women in, like... Like leather bikinis with armor plates. Yeah. And studs. It's very strange. (laughs) Now, some of the women are disguising themselves as prostitutes, I guess. But it doesn't explain the other two groups. (laughs) Well, I mean, the guards be like the, the the guards in their thing outfits being guards in their thing outfits that I get because why would you change? You're already in your your normal guard wear. But the barbarian women that I don't understand. You know what else I don't understand? Uh-huh. Bonds method for infiltrating this fight oh i thought you were gonna say how none of these women are indian oh well there's that but i thought that you know you see i i thought that just came with the territory here oh yeah but i guess if you're not watching the movie it's worth it's worth noting none of these women are indian oh yeah no i'd say most of them are are all extremely white yeah Yeah. there might be one or two non-white people in there but uh, very few so how is bond entering this fight graham Well, he's hitched a ride with Uncle Q in the standard 00 issue MI6 hot air balloon. Which balloon? With the Union Jack balloon. Very good. Do you know what I think the silliest part of the balloon is? Please. That Q has TV screens on the inside of it in the basket Uh that are displaying to him cameras on the outside of the basket. So that he can see things that he could more easily and quickly see by looking out of the basket. (laughs) So I'm going to give him I'm going to give him one tiny bit of credit here is that he is broadcasting the video feed to Bond's watch. That's yes, that's the only reason. That's not credit. That's <laughs> stupid. <laughs> you you've done a you've done this stupid thing just for the excuse of doing this other thing. <laughs> they lazily amble through this cacophony of things that are going on at the monsoon palace and Bond swings off the hot air balloon and into the palace and there's more shootouts going on. Bond slides down the banister, firing an AK-47. The The use of Bond using automatic weapons increases, I'd say, linearly over the course of the franchise. Yes. I think it was one of the middle Brosnan ones. Maybe it was The World Is Not Enough, where he's like on the deck of some ship with an automatic weapon in either hand, just, just dual wielding and firing both of them at once, where I was like, is this James Bond? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I think of the the Brosnan one, the shot that comes to mind is him in the cockpit. It's from an opening sequence, but him in the cockpit of the like the fighter jet that in the arms deal where there's like all the arms dealers are trading weapons and he's going to like steal the plane and he hops in the jet and he's got like an assault rifle and he's like mowing dudes down from the cockpit before he tosses the rifle and, and locks himself in. I do not remember that at all. Oh, well, spoilers for a future episode, I guess. Can't wait. So anyway, back to this movie. This fight scene has a lot of little moments that are very silly and goes on for what feels like an awfully long time. And it's a bit pants. 
Yeah. It's not great. No, <laughs> it's not great. No. Q shows Bond video of Khan and Gobinda leaving, having knocked Octopussy out and taking her with them. Because Khan says, knock her out and bring her with us because we'll need her. And I have no idea why. I cannot formulate a reason they would possibly need her. Yeah, I don't even think it's answered. I, I can't answer that for you. Cool. Bond pursues on horseback. They go down to a very small runway where there's a little plane. Don't worry, I have it here. A Beechcraft C-45H Expediter. Huh. It, I, I had the page open anyway, so this has shown up in a lot of different movies movies as it turns out yeah that doesn't surprise me like resident evil afterlife and babysitting 2 thanks internet movie plane database anyway <laughs> the climax of the movie is a fairly cool stunt you know this is like a tom cruise eat your heart out kind of moment no it's not roger moore doing the stunt but this is no a man on the outside of a plane. In fact, there's a couple shots in here that very closely mirror the shot from the recent Mission Impossible movie where the yeah. camera is attached to the outside of the plane as it's flying around and taking off. This is the same stunt performer from the beginning of Moonraker who did the skydiving stunts and looks enough like Roger Moore that they could get some pretty decent shots of him. Yeah. So they get into this plane, Gobinda and Khan and Octopussy, and start to take off. And Bond chases after them with the horse and jumps onto the outside of the plane and holds on for dear life as it takes off and they hear him do it yeah so they are not flying gently no they start flying very aggressively trying to knock bond off the plane they briefly after doing a series of of dives and climbs think they've done it but it turns out that bond has in fact managed to navigate himself over to the right wing just cracks it open on a little like service panel and just starts yanking cables out causing the uh the right engine of the plane to stop functioning which it does like they they have the real plane in the air and one of the propellers just stops yeah yeah and this is what it was that you were referring to yes that khan tells gobinda to do and he's like what really <laughs> what does he tell gobinda to do he says to go outside and deal with bond <laughs> and gobinda's <laughs> like what like, the, like out there out there <laughs> and he's like yes okay yes my excellence because he says yes my excellence every single time so yeah they go out and bond and gobinda gobinda with a knife goes outside and bond and gobinda have a knife fight on the roof of this plane both lying like they're not standing on the plane they're lying prone on the surface of the plane and gobinda is like slashing the knife at bond's face bond ultimately wins because there's an antenna on the top of the plane and he pulls back on the antenna trying to put distance between him and gobinda as this knife is like swinging in his face once it's pulled sufficiently far back he lets go of it and it snaps gobinda in the face like, you know, you're walking along a, a hiking trail and you pull a twig and it snaps the person behind you, catches him right in the face, hard enough to leave like a welt across his face. But that causes uh, Gobinda to scream in pain and let go of his grip and he falls to his death. Meanwhile, Khan inside the plane is still struggling to keep it airborne. So he starts to go like the plane starts to go down. Bond manages to get inside and grab Octopussy and the plane goes down. Bond and Octopussy leap out of the door at the last second before the plane plunges off a cliff and continues its descent behind a mountain where it crashes and explodes. At last, the evil has been defeated. <laughs> I didn't talk at all, actually, about Kamal Khan played by Louis Jordan. And I thought he was actually great as a Bond villain. Like, I think if he had been allowed to be the only Bond villain, I think he would have done a good job. Yeah. But this was a very muddy movie in that regard. And he he got upstaged by Orlov being such a character. He got upstaged by Orlov, yeah, as being overblown. And then he got sort of overshadowed by Octopussy as being presented as she's actually the one in charge. But she wasn't because Khan was working for her, but was actually working for Orlov. And so he was only this kind of toady middleman. Yeah. It probably should have been Orlov having this final showdown of like the madman going down in flames. Like Khan was just kind of a guy doing his job, being evil, cheating at backgammon. Yeah. There's a brief scene back at MI6. General Gogol is there talking to the Minister of Defense and M and being like, great, cheers. Let's all share drinks because we're all 
secretly friends, even though our countries are really touchy right now. And M reports that Bond is recuperating from his many injuries. And we transition to Octopussy's boat, where Bond is in traction. He has like his arm in a cast and the other arm in a sling and his leg up in traction, but still in this fabulous silken bed on the boat. Octopussy's like, oh, it's a shame you weren't feeling better because maybe we would do a sex. And then he's like, ha ha, I'm kidding. And just tears all the slings and medical accoutrements apart and is like, I'm actually fine. Let's bone. And they do because he was not really that hurt. He was using it as an excuse to get out of doing more work so that he could yeah hang around with octopussy yep uh and that's it roll credits roll credits and a video of octopussy's ship sailing away from camera into the sunset until they ran out of footage at which point the film reverses and it starts coming back towards camera until it fades out <laughs> no <laughs> yes i was watching it just sitting there chatting to kathleen watching the end credits and i was like hey what the heck just happened <laughs> it doesn't come all the way back it only comes a little way back but it's like around when they get down to the music credits there's like a bit where it goes like whoop and the water is going the other direction and i'm like oh what the wow heck? i admit i didn't watch through the credits i i i watched this last night because i was out of town this weekend so it was very late when i finished it last night and i did not have it in me to sit through the credits after having sat through that movie that's understandable <laughs> i i didn't catch that and it says james bond will return in from a view to a kill oh which was later of course changed to simply a view to a, a kill view to a kill yeah. all right well what did you think of it it was the best james bond movie released in 1983 <laughs> like i d it's gonna be better than never say never again on my list but yeah but never say never again is currently second from the bottom <laughs> Like it was, there were certainly a lot more things in it that I liked and a lot fewer things that I actively disliked than there were in Never Say Never Again. Right. But as we've said, it just, the experience of watching it was just very muddy and the plot was just, there was a lot of just like, why, why, uh, what's happening and why? And like character motivation was odd. And like I said, the between Khan and Orlov and Octopussy, it was unclear so it's one thing to say like it's you know that there's like a fake out of like who the real bad guy is and you can do that in an interesting way and this wasn't this was just unclear right it's like who's yeah who's actually in charge here and it was i guess it was orlov it's a shame that the movie's called octopussy which is a silly name but it's her name and she's presented as being sort of the one in charge the mastermind and she's actually just being used by every person in the movie mm -hmm. yeah it wasn't great. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this movie's pretty dire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's got some things I like, yeah. and it's got some fun things and a couple of cool action sequences. But I think without even looking at my Bond ranking, I think I can uncontroversially, because I'm going to start a controversy with myself if I suddenly decide I disagree, but I think I can uncontroversially say that this is the worst of the Roger Moore Bond movies for me i agree and, and what a bummer after for your eyes only yeah like what happened to that <laughs> that was so good so i mean i guess we're starting with the film where are you putting where are you putting that definitely below man with the golden gun because as i said it's it is the worst more bond movie so far you know what i think it goes in my third to last spot behind diamonds are forever that's exactly where i was gonna put it too <laughs> yeah it's it's right there in the bottom three above never say never again in casino royale i think i think i agree with you that it's better than never say never again but i don't think it's as clear as you do <laughs> i didn't say i thought it was clear well no no, no. I, I mean like i don't i don't think oh, the, the gulf oh. between them is that i don't think it's the clear winner of the two i, I got think you it's, i think it's it's a bit of a brawl between them to decide which one is the worst bond movie released in 1983 but I will give you that Octopussy probably wins out just by nature of being a little more competent in terms of feeling like a movie that was made by people who know how to make movies, specifically Bond movies. Yeah, that's that's the only place I'm coming at it from, too, is just there's places in Octopussy where I'm like, this is not a this is like the motivations and the characters and what's happening here is is not done well. But it like at least it's shot well and edited well and they know how to sort of move from scene to scene and everything. Whereas I found several moments in Never Say Never Again again very jarring in a sort of language of cinema kind of way yeah i need to very quickly listen to the opening titles again <laughs>
What is this song? Hang on. All Time High. All right. I've now listened to a brief moment of All Time High, and I now remember All Time High. All right. I don't love it. How do you feel about this song? <laughs> not. Uh, it's not great for me. Yeah. Looking at my list. Can't remember the theme song from Never Say Never Again. You Really? I couldn't get the thing out of my head for a week. I was so mad. I know, but it's, it's gone now, and I have to put it back in my head Would to you, compare. If you'd like some help, it's never, never say never again. Never. Oh, never yeah. say na, 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 na. yeah this is not as good as the one for the spy who loved me so i'm gonna put it below that spy who loved me was nobody does it better nobody does it better nobody does it half as good as you spy who loved me is better than this from Russia with Love is better than this. From Russia with Love honestly slaps. I need to go listen to this again. The like, thing is, my, my list is like, From Russia with Love up, they're all amazing songs. From Russia with Love made zero impression on me, I guess because it's in the end credits. I sh- guess I should go listen to it again because it's like, it's a complete cipher as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. From Russia with Love, or so it seems. <laughs> Which I'm now probably gonna, I almost certainly have misquoted the lyrics, but that's fine. At least Moonraker has the name of the movie in it. Moonraker does have the name of the movie in it, yes. This goes behind Moonraker for me. All right. I like this less than Moonraker, which actually means it goes in exactly the same slot as your SU numerically. Pre-title sequence. Maybe we can rate this one a little higher (laughs) as pre-title sequences go. I think so. I think it was actually pretty all right. That, I mean, that said, there's many that have been better. Oh, yeah. I think actually, though, despite the overall quality of the rest of the movie, I think for me, this is better than For Your Eyes Only, which was the extended not Blofeld sequence. Right. Was it better than Thunderball? Oh, Thunderball is the jetpack and the fight with... Oh, yeah, jetpack. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not as good as that. All right, there we go. That was easy. Oh, you think this is less good than than Jetpack, hey? I mean, it's cool. The little jet plane is sweet, and I like the horse butt thing, but it's a good fight that he has with Colonel Bouvar and uh, Thunderball and the jetpack and everything is pretty cool. I mean, I don't think this is a bad pre-title. I just think it's not one of the better ones for me. Well, far be it for me to break up our synchronicity so so far, but I'm going to rate it one higher. I'm going to put it above Thunderball. I think this one is a little more exciting, and I like the horse butt. The horse butt's cute. The disguise is cute. The costume switch is cute. I I like this one a little more than I like Thunderballs. And that'll do it. Will it? What, what's your most Bond moment of the movie? We've been negligent in doing our most Bond moments. Oh, you're right. I know what mine is. What's yours? <laughs> he pulls the Fabergé egg out of the backhand table. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is good. If not that, then probably handing the sword eater back his own sword and saying, you'd better put this one back yourself. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I approve your choice. I still think the best quip in the movie is still from VJ with saying, don't worry, it's a company car. Yeah. <laughs> So partial marks there, I suppose. All right. So there we are. There's Octopussy in the can. Thank God. Yeah. Next time, one that you and I at least both seem to recall liking more. Yeah. I have positive recollections. Same. So I look forward to seeing how it pans out. It's 1985's A View to a Kill, the last movie for Roger Moore and several other people with the franchise as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah. Until then, I want to thank you, as always, Matt. This is a blast every time. Always. Thrilled to be here. Yeah. And I want to thank Featherweight for doing the art, Matt Griffiths for doing the wonderful editing on the video version, and Heather for podcast admin. And of course, all of you, because this show and everything we do is brought to you by you directly and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun. And until next time, this podcast will return. Mm-hmm.